We have an eight and one seed with a terrible draw and a four and five seed with a fantastic draw and a lot of intriguing matchups in between. Mitch, we're here. It is the official View from the West playoff preview. Plenty to talk about tonight. This is usually, uh, I don't, I don't want to speak for you, but it's usually my favorite episode of the year that we do. Uh, so anyone listening, strap in. It's going to be a long episode, but we're going to deep dive into uh, all of our area games and tell you a little bit about the opponents and what we think is going to happen here in uh, just a couple of days. We'll be talking about every game, every team from our area that's in the playoffs. We'll be breaking down their opponents, talking about the matchups. Let's waste no more time. Let's get into it. Talking Illinois high school football. If your goals are as high as you talk about, tonight, tonight, you go out and just take one more step. It's a view from the West. And it starts right now! Welcome into View from the West podcast, the podcast covering Illinois high school football on the western side of the state of Illinois. I'm your host, Greg Armstrong, joined once again, as always, by Mitch Stormer. Mitch, I felt like we were just on a pod together not too long ago, but here we are. This is now the official playoff preview show. We're breaking it all down. We're getting into it. It's playoff time. Yeah, what, this is our third show in three days, something like that? I think so. So, uh, but yeah, you know, this is, this is the time where this is when it's fun, right? So we, we just went through nine weeks, uh, exciting action as always, but now we, we are down to the best 32 teams in each class. Uh, we're fortunate to cover a lot of good teams uh, in our area and this year is no different. So yeah, I can't wait to dig into this tonight with you. And, uh, we got some teams playing each other. Uh, we've got potential matchups in the second round if our teams win. So, yeah, a lot of opportunity here for, for teams to keep on going and make a run. Yeah, we'll, we'll break it all down. But overall, it was kind of a it was a weird kind of a weird week nine. And I felt like a weird, you know, selection process as you know, as the projections kept coming out. I just felt like compared to other years, just some strange things happening. The more we kept hearing about, you know, four and five teams are going to get let in. But just how many. And then as it turns out. One of the teams in our area, Sterling, is one of the last teams let in at four and five. Just a weird way that things worked out. We'll talk about their matchup. We'll talk about all the matchups of the teams in our local area. We're going to jump into it, but before we do, you know who we got to thank, Mitch. Yep, as always, the next episode is brought to you by our friends at Breedlove Sporting Goods, Western Illinois' premier sporting goods store for uniforms, apparel, equipment, awards, and online team stores. They provide all the same sporting goods services the big nationwide companies do, but with a faster turnaround and their uniform pricing is a fraction of the cost that you're probably used to. They offer name brands such as Adidas, Under Armour, and Nike, and are extremely responsive with any inquiries. With a primary focus on the western side of the state of Illinois, Breedlove Sporting Goods is the fastest way to outfit your team. Check them out on Facebook or at breedlovesports.com. Or shoot Cal Breedlove an email at calbreedlove at gmail.com for more information. As always, we thank Breedloves for their sponsorship. Love having, uh, you know, love having a partnership with them all season long. That'll continue on. I'm excited for that partnership we got there. If you'd like to sponsor the podcast, send us an email to viewfromwestpod at gmail.com. Or if you want to just support what we're doing, if you want to, you know, send money our way to support local high school athletics. You could do that by going to PayPal. It's as simple as going to paypal.me slash view from West pod. Again, that's paypal.me slash view from West pod. If you like what you're hearing here and you want to help us out, we would certainly appreciate it. Goes a long way to, you know, making this show possible every week. It's a passion for us, but you know, there are some costs involved with it. So any way you can support us, we would appreciate it. Spread the word. Let people know that you like what you're listening to here. Help grow our audience. All that good stuff. Well, Mitch, it's been, you referenced it. I think we've done about three or four podcasts here in about three or four days. It has been, it has been a gauntlet. We have talked a lot about week nine. We've talked a lot about the playoffs already, but this is our official playoff preview show for the View from the West podcast. We'll break down all the teams from our area and the matchups they have and kind of the, you know, what it could mean down the road as we get farther into the playoffs, you know, when some of our teams advance. But, um, you know, if you want to hear about week nine, how the season wrapped up, 
You can go back and listen to our Week 9 Instant Reacts podcast. It was uh, Mitch, you and I, along with Kyle Kampmeyer. We were talking to, you know, a little bit about projections and kind of how things were going to shake out. But we talked a lot about Week 9 and what happened, you know, right as it was happening. Right, We literally hit record, I think, right when that Quincy score went final. And that was the last game in the area to go final. So we, you know, we literally started that podcast right as the regular season ended. So that's a good way to kind of get your final results from week nine before we headed into the playoffs. If you want to go onto YouTube and check out NUIC football, we were live on Saturday night. I was joined by, uh, I was with Kyle Kampmeyer at NUICfootball.com along with Joe Meridian. And we were focused on uh, the eight man uh, playoff pairings being announced as well as one, two, and class 3A. So we were, you know, reviewing the brackets as they were being unveiled. We talked a lot about a lot of different teams from not just our area, but from around the state. We were live, but you can go find it right now on YouTube at NUIC Football. And uh, it was great. It was, you know, they're so knowledgeable. Kyle and Joe with the eight-man ranks. And, you know, Joe knows, you know, a lot about 1A and uh, through 2A as well. So it was, you know, really great to hear what he had to say and kind of his take on things. And uh, just a really great show overall. Mitch, I think you were tuned in for a little while on Saturday night. Did you get some, did you get some info or some, you know, some good stuff there? Oh, yeah. You guys uh, did a great job. Um, as always, every year you guys break it down the best. Um, certainly didn't have any issues getting your stream up. Um, can't say that for some other playoff shows that went on on uh, on Saturday night. So, yeah, you guys did a great job. Uh, best small school coverage in the state, I think. And, yeah, always cool to see that kind of break it down as it's live, right? Because um, Kyle has his projections, and he was pretty pretty spot on with most of it. There were some changes, nothing major. Um, so, you know, you might have had an idea, but still those those last-second curveballs are always going to happen. So you guys did a great job covering it, and I hope everyone enjoyed uh, enjoyed the show. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Mitch, also on top of, you know, joining NUIC football that night, uh, earlier in the day on Saturday, I went, uh, I went recorded an interview with Jim Taylor and Ty Taylor from WRMJ Radio. So that's also out there. They do a pigskin playoff preview every year. They've been doing it, I mean, since the early 90s. They've been doing this show. So th- this is, you know, a longtime tradition for WRMJ. They do a great job. They get a lot of coaches' interviews. So I would encourage you to go check them out as well. Go to WRMJ.com. Check out local sports. They have the entire show posted up there. So it was fun chatting with them. And Mitch, I will say that in the interview with them, I referenced that, you know, playoff pairings night is so exciting. And for all the criticism that the IHSA takes, rightly or wrongly, I said it in their interview that this is one thing that they do really well, right? That they create this excitement and the playoff pairings and the show and all the buzz around the high school football playoffs. And then we get to Friday night, and I start hearing about people can't get the live stream on NFHS. And there are some areas in the state where the broadcast is on tape delay, so they can't watch Mm -hmm. it live. I just, as soon as I I compliment them for how well they do, and I don't know if it's an IHSA thing or an NFHS live streaming thing, either way, it's very disappointing that like people were, I know for a fact that Marquette high school, my, you know, my alma mater, they get together every year and they watch, they have a big party with, you know, the team and the fans and the you know, community all come together to watch the pairings. And they tried to get it onto a TV and it froze up and it was delayed. And by the time that the one, a pairings were out, they never saw it. They never saw their name. Mm-hmm. They just, they just learned about it on Twitter. So it's like, how right. disappointing is that? How deflating is that to meet up at this party? And then it's like, up. Oh, too late they already announced their name so right know. yeah imagine imagine it's like march madness right and you're watching the cbs selection show and then the feed just cuts out right it was it was so disappointing to see that that you had teams that were doing doing partings and couldn't get the stream up i mean a newman coach michael may texted me hey is the stream working it wasn't working for me either so yeah just just an all-around disappointing thing so again we don't know what the technical difficulties were um but yeah just the absolute worst time for something like that to happen. Yeah. And it, well, and on top of that, um, the IHSA website wasn't working for a good part of the night as the brackets were being unveiled. 
and I See, get I didn't, it. I didn't recognize, I didn't recognize that because that's how I was getting the information. So I, I don't know if that was maybe intermittent, but I, yeah. didn't, I didn't, I didn't notice that myself. Okay. There were several times that I was trying to access just, you know, the team pages with the schedules and the results. And it was probably, you know, free, you know not probably, a ton of tra- probably a ton of traffic because the stream wasn't working. Yeah, that's, that's probably fair. And I get it. Um, you know, that's one of those things where, you know, one day a year, their, their website's going to be overrun. Um, you know, so I get it. That's hard to manage. You'd think you'd have fail safes in place to ensure that your website can handle that sort of traffic. I don't know. I'm not an IT guy, but I, I would assume there's ways that you can have fail safe for that. But yeah. overall, the, you know, kind of to wrap up this conversation, the, the, the live stream not working and like in the past couple of years, they had done a pre-show and a post-show. They canceled that. They scrapped that. So they didn't have that. Mm-hmm. So it felt kind of like a dumbed down version anyway. And then people couldn't even watch it. So I just feel right. like, you know, at the end of the day, whoever, wherever the fault lies, whether it's through NFHS or IHSA, like you're diminishing the student experience, the student athlete experience here. And that's what's disappointing is that, mm-hmm. you know, this, for a lot of these kids who are seniors, this was their, you know, potentially one night to have this big playoff pairings, you know, get together and to kind of relish, you know, to kind of appreciate the moment and it's gone. It just didn't happen. And that's, that's what's disappointing right. to me is that you're, you know, you're, you're letting down those student athletes, you know, you're, you're missing out on the experience there. And, and on top of it, Mitch, I, you know, I get screen grabs from Rova Williams field name is announced on the line against Sterling Newman and they're called mid County. They haven't right. been, they haven't been mid County in three years. I don't, I don't even know how that happens. They're not even listed as mid County. Like, on no. the playoff outlook, on the playoff qualifiers. I don't understand how that even happened. And again, I get it. There's a lot of teams in the IHSA. There's a lot of co-ops in the state. I understand all that. But guess what? Midway through the season, when we realized that Lewiston was a co-op and not just Lewiston, what did we do? We did research right. and found out who well, it was. And, and not only that, but like, you know, it was correct on the bracket online. So you would think, that there was some sort of quality assurance that had to have happened from the graphics guy at IHSA TV looking yeah. at the bracket. I don't know. I just, I don't understand how that could have happened. It does not make any sense. I don't know. Again, it's another thing that's just disappointing. Like it just kind of yeah. shows like some laziness or lack of, you know, lack of concern for smaller schools. And that's, to me, that's the ultimate disappointment is that, you yeah. know, I don't know if I would hope that the effort, I really hope, the effort isn't all poured into 8A, 7A, 6A. And then, you know, as you go down the list, it's like, well, just get the brackets on there. I don't want to think that's the case. But when you throw up a mid-county graphic that's three years old, that's disappointing. Like that, yeah. that was a letdown for me, you know, and especially a letdown for that program. I mean, you know, not just for me, but I'm just, you know, a person from the area that wants to promote that school. But for them in particular, right. it's disappointing. So, yeah, and, and you know, I have to say does does a great job on state championship weekend, right? Like their television production for those eight games is always really, really well done. Their broadcast team is really good. You know, this year they made great strides with IHSAfootball.com having scores updated a lot better than they were in the past with Absolutely. score zone. So they, you know, there's, there's there's signs there that they they do a great job and they made improvements. So again, I don't know what happened on Saturday night, but boy, it was, it was not good. And you hope that they're making amends to try and fix that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you pointed that out. Cause you're right. I mean, I think, you know, we try to, you know, see the positives in these things and I do, I, I try to, you know, promote the IHSA and not be hypercritical, you know, when there is a lot of voices that are hypercritical around the state, some fair, some unfair, I would say, but in general, I try to support what they're doing and promote the IHSA football product. Cause that's, you mm-hmm. know, that's what we're all here to do, right? They want to promote the product. We're trying to promote the product that they're putting out there. So I want to promote it. And I think that's why I get so frustrated when it just yeah. kind of falls a little short on this, you know, Saturday night. So yeah, Mitch, we'll get into all the brackets here, but um, you know, there's one other bone we have to pick with the IHSA. Do you want to do it now? Or do you want to wait until that matchup rolls out, you know, in a little bit? <laughs> um, yeah let's wait yeah all right that's a tease ahead there's one other you know kind of nitpicky thing i have and we'll we'll get into that in a minute well mitch when we're starting in the playoffs 
Let's start with the Western Big Six. We'll start in Class 7A. We'll start with our big schools. That's Quincy. Maybe one of the best teams in our area. Maybe one of the best teams we've seen in, in a few years, you know, especially in that yeah. Western Big Six, you know, on the, on the bigger school side of things here. Quincy will host West Chicago, um, the number 30 seed. Oh, that sounds good, doesn't it? The number 30 it seed. It sure does. <laughs> no, no offense to West Chicago. They probably don't love being the 30 seed. In general, I just like that it's one through 32 seeding. Anyway, I, I digress. I'll, I'll tell you what, we'll get into it in a minute. I bet they do love that they're the 30 seed because this has been a long time coming, but we'll get into that in a minute. Okay, sounds good. So West Chicago will travel to Quincy. Obviously, the Blue Devils sitting at 9-0. and They're the three seed. West Chicago is 5-4. and four. That game will be on Saturday, 2 o'clock at Flynn Stadium. The Wildcats out of the Upstate 8 Conference, head coach Adam Chavez in his second season. This is their fourth playoff appearance and their first appearance since 2002. So it's been a while. It's been a long time since West Chicago's been in the postseason. They were 1974 3A state champions, but they're back now in the playoffs. And it's, you know, not a, you know, not a regular thing here for them. This is a unique, you know, situation that you know they don't find themselves in the playoffs very often but here they are yeah and this is this is why I just I kind of said I think that they would be thrilled to be a 30 seed in the playoffs because this is only their fourth winning season since they won that 74 state title so um you know Adam Chavez in his second season I think he's really got a good thing going here um five and four you know all those wins did come against teams with losing records but the they were battle tested because all those losses came to good programs in that conference, like South uh, Elgin, Glenbard South, Glenbard East. Um, you know, they're outscored pretty heavily in those games, 185 to 47. But again, this is a program who's been down bad for a while. Haven't had a winning record again since 1974. So back in the playoffs. Um, now, Greg, this is, this is a, this is a nugget by Chris Dewar. I'll let you read this. This is a pretty cool connection between, these two programs. Yeah. So the head coach of the 1974 team for West Chicago was Paul Unruh, the father of Jim Unruh, who coached Quincy head coach, Rick Little at Carthage high school. So yeah, that is, that is a crazy connection, but yeah, here we are. Yeah. I don't, I wonder how that got uncovered. <laughs> yeah. I want I, I mean, I, I would imagine that, Coach Little's the only one who had that information and probably said it to somebody. So yeah, uh, you know, good for good for Chris to get that nugget out there because yeah, that's pretty cool. I was gonna say, how did it get uncovered? Because Chris Dewar is the best because he leaves that's, no that's stone true, yeah. unturned. Yeah, that's true. So all right, well, give us some uh, names to watch here, or a couple names to watch here for West Chicago. Yeah, sure. Um, they got a guy named, kid named Vincent. It's M U C I. Either that's that's Mookie Moochie. Um, but we'll say Moochie. Yep. Uh, he had five touchdowns in the week nine win that got them uh, into the playoffs. Looking at the games this season, he's usually right around that 120 plus yards, multiple touchdowns. Um, they've got another guy, Lewis Zeitler. He's a, a receiver and plays defensive back. He gets a lot of all purpose yards for them. So two pretty good players on this, on this Wildcats team. Um, when looking at some of their results, some of their film, Greg, we've got to talk uniforms, right? We've got to we've got to find some uniform notes here. I put some in here this this week. They've got an interesting helmet. Um, their their logo is like an interlock. It, it reminds me of Robo Williams Field in a little bit, but they interlock their letters. It's the CW locked. They put it on the front, like right above. Okay. Uh, just right in the front of the helmet. Yeah. Right above right above the face mask, and then they have the numbers on the sides. So, mm -hmm. um. It, it's kind of busy, but it, it's interesting to say the least. And then uh, they got nice, clean Under Armour uniforms. So, you know, they're going to look good. That's going to be a good uniform matchup there at Flint Stadium on Saturday. Yeah. Uh, the other fun fact about uh, West Chicago is I believe, I believe that a junior and high school baseball player, Greg Armstrong in the Marquette Crusaders, I believe we traveled to West Chicago for a non-conference road game in baseball. So, if you needed to know that, never, that, ne <laughs> never heard of them. If, <laughs> if that factors into this game at all, it, it's, I just wanted to let you know. That, right. Yes. Where's Chris Dewar with that information? Huh? <laughs> yeah. We're going to uncover that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. 
So, Quincy, 13th playoff appearance. They lost in the 6A second round a year ago. It's their first 9-0 regular season since 1935. You know, Mitch, we've talked a lot about him this year for good reason. Braden Little leading the way at quarterback. You have Jareus Rice. He was our Matthewson's Mini Helmets Player of the Week last week, or in Week 8. Um, he's been, you know, delivering great performances all year long. But then you also have Aiden Byquist and Jack Metalmeyer and, uh, man, who else? Um, Ty Kel Hammers, yeah. Ty Douglas on the defensive side of the ball. So you start, you know, going through the list, and it's it's a lot of names that, you know, week in and week out, they're they're delivering. This, this Quincy team looks like they're, uh, you know, they're set to play at least a couple games in the playoffs. I'm highly doubting this is the last time we talk Quincy this season. Yeah, I don't think so. And I don't think I don't think what you just mentioned is anything against Quincy. It's just that 7A is such a gauntlet of heavy hitting Chicago area teams, especially I don't want to say in the south, but like the southern part of this bracket um, where, where Quincy has to travel through. If you look at who and I, I do think Quincy will win this game. So if you look at their round two, they're going to play either Whitney Young or Wheaton North. If they even continue on the path, they might run into Mount Carmel at some point. So it's just really, really good programs in this 7A. You've got a Brother Rice team who's the 26th seed playing Batavia, who played for the title last year or the year before. So, you know, 7A is just a lot of really good teams. But Quincy is deservedly right in that three spot. They've been great all season. They are a lot of fun to watch. I do think they're equipped to make a run. They're just going to run into some really quality teams the further they go. Yeah, you're right. And that's kind of like, that's what I'm excited for. Like, they're in 7A this year. They've been in 6A in years past. I'm excited to see them meet up with some of the the heavy hitters, you know, whoever it may mm-hmm. be down the road. I mean, we always say that the team can't look ahead, but we can look ahead. I right. I am kind of looking down the way to see, well, who who are these potential matchups? And I just, I... I want the opportunity for Quincy to really like have one of those statement type wins, you know, where everybody in the state says, wait, they beat who, you know what I mean? Like that's what I'm right. looking forward to because this team is they so talented, but so poised. Right. And they seem ready for the moment. Like I, so I know we're only, we're talking round one today, but I, I am excited to see where this all ends up and how, just how far they can go. So yeah. Yeah. Just, just looking at this, this game here uh, against, West Chicago. I, I think that that defense is for, for the Wildcats is, is prone to giving up some big numbers to good teams. So I do think that this will be a showcase for the Quincy offense. Um, as long as that defense has been playing the way that they played against Bahama Seymour and really against all of their Western big six competitions, they're going to be fine. They're going to be moving on to round two. Yep. All right. Well, do we uh, jump down to uh, class five a here? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe the most intriguing game here, Greg. Um, yeah. But, well, okay, I don't want to say intriguing because we've got a lot of those. But the biggest upset potential, I think. Yeah, I would say that's absolutely fair and accurate. The number 16 seed, the Sterling Golden Warriors, at four and five. One of the six teams that were four wins. <laughs> yeah, it was six or seven, but I think that they were 252 out of yeah. 256 to get in. Yeah. So they, I believe, had 50 playoff points, which is what pushed them in as a four-win team. They go on the road to Lane Stadium against number one in the north of Class 5A, number one, Chicago Payton. So Chicago yeah. Payton is 9-0. and The Grizzlies play in the Chicago Public White West Conference. Craig Naki, would that be how you pronounce that, you believe? Sure. <laughs> so... It is the Grizzlies' 12th appearance, only one playoff win in school history. They lost in the second round last season, and they were the one seed in 2018, but lost in the first round. So, Mitch, you did the the homework here. What do we know about Chicago Payton? Yeah, this is an interesting story here. Okay, so... um, The the full name is is Walter Payton College uh, Prep. Walter Payton, obviously, it's named after who you think it's named after. Named after the Bears, great. I don't, I don't think like there's any like family affiliation. I think it's just what they named the school. Okay, but the schools are are dark blue and orange, just like the Bears. 
There's nods to 34 all around the school. So very much uh, uh, a tribute to Walter Payton, a much deserved tribute to have a school named after such a great human being as Walter Payton was. Since 2019, Greg, Payton has been the number one public school in Illinois and the fourth best in the country. So that's these are some the, really that's... <laughs> Yeah. And they they do selective enrollment, which I don't understand. I mean, it must be just you have to apply, but it's public. I don't know. Yeah. But they just seem to attract really, really smart kids um that, that go on to to do great things. So yeah, the number one public school in Illinois, but the fourth best in the country, right right here at the, the uh the Chicago Payton uh prep. Mitch, that is the that is the prep work that uh you know, that we're looking for here on View from the West podcasters. And nothing, nothing that we don't bring you in these matchups. Great work right. there. I can, I can also say that they would not have admitted me had I. <laughs> um, they've got 41 opponent wins. They played five playoff teams. But the thing is, is that they, it's a full schedule of Chicago public schools. We've talked about Chicago public schools on this podcast a lot, especially when it comes to the playoff time. And we by no means are, are, are harking on them or trying to devalue what they do. It's just the level of competition is not there. Um, they're undefeated and they beat all Chicago public schools. That's, that's great for them, right? They get the number one seed here, but they haven't played anybody. That's, that's just the problem that I see here. And if you look historically, you mentioned that they were the number one seed in 2018, lost in round one. They have a history of that. Last year, they won in round one. I think it was against a public school, a Chicago public school. And that was their only win in the 11 times prior that they've been to the playoffs. So um, also the thing, Greg, it was pretty hard to find any information about the actual football team. That's why I really don't have much. I found one player. uh, I'm going to see if I can pronounce this right. Nicholas Kausta Nicholas. Uh, he anchors both of their lines. He gets some looks. He's been to camps at some big, um, you know, uh, Ivy League schools, the, the Dartmouths, the Yales, the Harvards, University of Chicago right there in his backyard. But I really don't have anything about, about this Peyton team. And that's what gives me some sort of hope that I think this could be a game that Sterling wins. Yeah, I, I mean – from what I've heard, I mean, from what I know about the Chicago Public League teams that enter the playoffs and kind of how they've fared against the Western Big Six and against other teams around the state come playoff time, yeah, it's a matchup that stands out to me as, man, like Sterling could win this game. What a what a wild season it's been for Sterling. I mean, two weeks ago, go ahead. I was just going to say, you mentioned that against Western Big Six, because who did Sterling play last year? It was like Robert Good Stem or something, whatever that school was called. Yeah, it was Sarah and Good. They, I was going to say, I was going to make Good, the, what it was? I was going to make the joke that I, I've heard of Walter Payton, but I had not heard of Sarah Good, who they played last year. So Right. And Sterling dominated that game. Absolutely yeah. dominated that game. They yep. had, they had, Stem had a couple of good kids. They made a couple plays. But other than that, that was a, a Sterling blowout. So, um, yeah, okay. Talk about Sterling's uh, end of the season, how they got in. Sorry to d- derail you what no, you're talking about. No, I mean, it just, when you start looking back at how the season played out, I mean, go back to, let's see, in week eight, in week eight, they lose to Rock Island 14 mm-hmm. 7. And you think, all right, they're entering week nine with only three wins, and Moline is playing at four and four. So, you know, the focus kind of from our end was on Moline because Mm -hmm. Sterling could play spoiler, but you know, the odds of them getting in were not great. And then as the game's playing out, I think we mentioned it in the instant reacts podcast, you know, that I heard when Quincy, when Sterling was winning that Jim Spencer on the broadcast said like, you know, if, if we win this, we're four and five. And I think we still have a chance. I think we still have a chance. And I had texted with, uh, head coach, John Schlemmer this weekend and I asked him, like, did you know going in that, like, at four and five, you could still get in, that there'd be a path for you to get in? And he said, yeah, that they, they did. They did think that their playoff points would be high enough. And based on what they were seeing, that, um, you know, they thought they might be able to get in. 
you know, at four and five. Now, I don't know if he knew that six four and five teams would get in, you know, but mm. um, he did think that, you know, they weren't just going to play the role of spoiler. He, he had, you know, they were talking about winning and getting in the playoffs. And here they are. It's, it's wild because on the opposite side, Moline ends with the identical record and they're out. I mean, how much did that flip on its head from going into the week thinking Moline was playing for a playoff spot and they don't make it. So, right. Yeah. Um, Very weird the way it all played out. And now to get this matchup is even kind of more like, wow. Like now you have a chance to potentially win a playoff. you got a good draw out of everything. Right. So Sterling, Sterling ended with, I think 50, I think think it was 50. 50, Yep. 50 playoff opponents. So, um, and they played what five playoff teams, Metamora, St. Francis, Princeton, Quincy, that's four. Okay, so they played four playoff teams. Um, but yeah, and it goes back to what we talked about before with, with Moline. And of course, Moline didn't win this game, but even if they had won, Moline would have maybe needed some help. And I don't know how it all shook out, but yeah. my point being that not filling that bye week against or for the Allman game, and I know Moline tried. I'm not saying that they did not. I know how hard that was for all the teams that we cover. What kind of links it went to to fill in those spots, but it just goes to show if you can't fill that week, it's going to hurt you in playoff points. So if you look at what Sterling had, all of their three non-conference games this year were against playoff teams: seven and two Metamora, seven and two St. Francis, and an eight and one Princeton team. In the end, that could have been what might have pushed them into that final 256. Yeah, I think absolutely. You know, that they they were challenged with a tough schedule and it, you know, in a weird way, even though they didn't get the wins, it paid off for them to get into the playoffs, to have those playoff points. So Mitch, you mentioned Wheaton St. Francis. If Sterling can get the win here, if they pull off the upset in the first round, that's who's waiting for them potentially. Wheaton St. Francis at seven and two is the eight seed, or Rochelle is the nine seed. So it former would be a, and former NCIC opponents, is that right? Correct. That would be correct. Right. Yeah, going back a few years, but yes. Intriguing matchup either either way there. Um, yeah. Yep. Of course, win, win, win the game first, and again, I think they can. For for Sterling, this is their thirty fifth playoff appearance. It's their twentieth time in the last twenty two seasons. They had winning records in both of those years that they didn't make it. Um, they were five and four in 2013 and didn't get in. And then the, the COVID year where they didn't play playoffs. So, um, yeah, they went to the quarterfinals last year in five a loss. So just continued success here for this this Sterling Golden Warrior program. And uh, what a, what a win this could potentially be there on, on Saturday afternoon at 4 p.m. Yeah, big matchup obviously for Sterling. And uh, you know I think jump out quick on this, you know, Chicago Payton team. And I mm-hmm. think that'll go a long way, you know, to get it, get a quick lead, build some confidence, build some momentum and, you know, ride that. I think they, they could walk away with a victory here. I also want to say that that lane stadium is where they played that Sarah good game. Yeah. It's really cool. Pretty, I've seen, yeah, I'm pretty positive. That's where they played that game. Yeah. It's a really cool stadium. I've never been there, but I've seen it, you know, in highlights and stuff. So yeah. Yep. All right. Well, I shouldn't mention, I should have mentioned up near the top of the show. But if you want to get, you know, we're talking about all the matchups featuring our local teams here. If you want to get more of our reaction to the brackets in general and kind of the the seedings and the way everything played out, I encourage you to go on to Twitter, go on to the X, and we have a retweeted post where we went on to spaces and we did a live reacts on Saturday night. Mitch and I jumped in and uh, went through each bracket, 1A through almost basically down through 8A. And we talked about all the teams, um, you know, from our area. But then we also talked about, you know, the teams from around the state that were catching our eye and the brackets and kind of what we thought about the brackets and who may be able to make a run in each one of those brackets. So if you're looking at more big picture bracket talk, I encourage you to go out to Twitter and we'll get that pinned up on top of our page. And uh, you can hear, you know, kind of our thoughts on the brackets in general. So. Well, if we're uh, done with uh, that matchup, we do move down into uh, 4A. Couple teams, yep. couple teams in Class 4A. We'll start in the North bracket. We have the number 10 seed Geneseo Maple Leafs at six and three. They go on the road 
to Plunkett Athletic Complex in Elmhurst. The st- defending state champions, IC Catholic, coming in at 7-2. and two. This game will be Saturday at 5 p.m. Man, I tell you, Mitch, we, in our local area, we can't avoid IC Catholic. Somebody's going to run into them at some point. I think a few years ago, it was Monmouth Roseville. Obviously, the last couple of years, it's been Princeton deeper into the playoffs. And now this year, mm-hmm. Geneseo. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I see Catholics been a team that we've talked at, at lengths about in terms of, you know, the, the public private debate, um, the, uh, what am, amp, not amplifier. What am I, what am I thinking of? Multiplier. The, uh, there you go. <laughs> multiplier. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> multiplier and how that all works. But, you know, yeah, we can't seem to get away from them. It, this is, look, let's just get into it. This is, I, I said on, Saturday night. This is not the team you want to run into. <laughs> like Geneseo aside, right? Anybody. Yeah. Not the team you want to see. This is a, a well coached, incredibly talented team. And we'll get into their players in a minute because it's the same players they had last year. Um, when you add the fact that Geneseo seems to have come down a little bit, right? They, they've lost three of their last four after starting 5-0. and oh. not, the, not the way you want to enter the 4A playoffs and certainly not the team you want to face going into the 4A playoffs. So, um, look, Geneseo has been battle-tested. There's no question. They've got a great offense. They've played well on defense all year. Um, you know, Historically, these are two really, really good programs, right? They've got a lot of trophies amongst them. Um, let's see that because what uh, Genesio has four uh, first places and IC Catholic has six. So this is historically, right, two really, really successful programs that are going to meet. And that's exciting, right? This is two programs that are uh, that are going to be fun to watch on a, on a gridiron together. It's just what IC Catholic does year in and year out, no matter the class, no matter the conference, because they played in the in the CCL this year for the first time and pretty much passed with flying colors. Well, and you talked about at the beginning of the year how much of a gauntlet schedule they had going into the mm-hmm. CCL Orange and that you mm-hmm. thought maybe, you know, secretly they kind of got thrown the hardest schedule as the, you know, new kid on the block. And, yeah. and they still end up at 7-2. and two. So... Yeah, it that's impressive, and they, they're a dangerous team, no doubt about it. Yeah, with their losses only being a one point loss to Wheaton St. Francis, and then they, I don't remember the story, but like they sat all their starters the very next week when they played the number one team in eight A in Loyola Academy, and they lost pretty bad, forty seven nothing. But again, didn't they didn't play their guys. Yeah, and I don't know. At the end of the continue. day, it didn't. It didn't. Maybe it didn't make any difference. They knew they were going to be in the playoffs, right. so you know they didn't. Right. Exactly. But, yeah. They came back and won their their next two the last two weeks of the season pretty handily. So, um, look, the Knights out of IC Catholic Elmhurst, coached by Bill Kraft. This is their twenty fourth appearance, their eighth consecutive appearance across, as we said, a couple of different classes, six state titles in school history. They've won four in the last six seasons. Um, these two teams have met. They've met once. It was a Green Machine win in nineteen seventy eight state quarterfinals. Well, IC Catholic was probably known as uh, Immaculate Conception at that time. Is that right? Yeah, that yeah, I believe so. Yep, yep. Okay, uh, that was one of the Leaf State titles that year. So shout out to uh, our friends of the Geneseo accounts on Instagram and Twitter for that nugget. So not the first time these two schools I've met, but it's first certainly the first time in a, in a while. Mm-hmm. Um, as you mentioned, they are the defending three A state champions, and I put in here drag on players to watch just about everybody. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and again, these are guys that we talked about last year. Their quarterback, Dennis Mandela. He has accepted a preferred walk on at Texas A&M. One of his targets, um, Eric Garner, four-star recruit as a tight end. He, he's going to Texas A&M. You've got a central, or sorry, a central Michigan commit on the line in Daniel Grain. You've got Joey, uh, Joey Gilada. Gilada. Yeah. Joey I- Gilada. Yeah, who I think just ran wild in the playoffs last year. K.J. Parker, who's their top receiver, he's going to Iowa. 
They've got a junior linebacker, Dominic Hullick, who's a Notre Dame target. So just like this whole roster of Knights are just incredibly talented guys. So it's it's a really, really tough matchup for Geneseo. I'm excited to see this game. Again, I've, I've been impressed with Geneseo. They, they've just kind of limped their way towards the, the end of the season here. But what better time to get the ship right and, and get a win here at Elmhurst, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was impressed last year with Mandala at quarterback, and Gelada did a lot of the heavy lifting for them against Princeton, right? Didn't he have a huge game? He had a huge game the week before. I want to... I don't remember if it was him or like their third string guy who no one knew about. Cause that, but I don't remember if that was the same kid or not. I really I want to say, I want to say there was another name we talked a lot about. And then Gelada yeah. was the kid who ended up getting a lot of the yardage in that game. So yeah, I mean, it, he was a, you know, a name we talked about last year for sure. And, you know, you already kind of talked a little bit about it, but it is, it is a fascinating matchup in the fact that it's, you know, the current kind of state power in IC Catholic versus the longtime historic state power in Geneseo, you know, with all the state titles going back to the 70s, 80s, and 90s for Geneseo. And the current 40, 43rd playoff appearance, Greg. 43 yeah. Times. Yep. Most of them have been in the 4A field. They lost last year in the first round. I believe it was that road trip down to Carterville. They lost in that one in the first round. Um, but yeah, like you said, I mean, it's, it's a good Geneseo team, you know, this, this season, you know, AJ Weller and Jaron Neal have done a great job, but the last few weeks, you know, that game against Sterling was a little concerning because they didn't score very much. And, uh, you know, you also looked at that game against Rock Island where they lost 15, 12, and we just kind of wonder where the offense is at because it was there early in the season, right? So it's just, yeah, can you get things figured out? And I, I, you know, I like what Coach Johnson does out there. I'm sure he'll have these guys ready and game plan will be in place. Um, but you, you got to execute at a really high level. You cannot afford many mm -hmm. mistakes against this IC Catholic team. Yeah, they're they're beatable, right? I mean, they they lost a couple times this year. They've they've lost when they've had good teams in the playoffs. So it's yep. It's not like they're it's impossible. They're just if you've never seen them, you're you're in for a bit of a treat because they they are a very very good football team. Yep. So again, that one's Saturday at five o'clock. So a little later in the day. Um, I'm hoping it's live streamed somewhere because uh, you know by the time. If you go to a playoff game early and get home, you could probably sit down and watch a little bit of that one. So Yeah, I want to say Icy Catholic does their own thing. Okay. If I remember correctly. So it might be a YouTube thing. But yeah. Uh we'll try and find all the links certainly and, and shoot them out before uh before Saturday. We've got we've got some Friday games that we'll talk about here. Uh actually one the very next game we're gonna talk about, but yeah. um we'll we'll try and get all those links out for everybody. Well, yeah, let's stay in class four A. The other team we have from our area in class four A in the South Bracket. Number four, tier, number three seed Kiwani at eight and one will host Peoria Notre Dame at five and four. That one's a Friday night kickoff, seven o'clock, Kiwani Stadium. So the Peoria Notre Dame Irish from the Big Twelve head coach Pat Armstrong, shout out to the last name there, no relation. Playoff mm -hmm. history, eighteen appearances. Last season broke a ten-year streak of making the playoffs. They lost in round one in twenty twenty-one. So, Mitch, what have we read about Peoria, Notre Dame, the Irish? Yeah, so looking at the Irish here, you know, there's there's been a lot of examples from teams that we we researched that, you know, all their wins come against teams that finish with a losing record. All their losses come against teams with a winning, a winning record. And, and Peoria, Notre Dame is one of those situations. Um, we kind of talked about Geneseo maybe limping in here. Peoria, Notre Dame is, is doing the exact same thing. They've got a three-game losing streak heading into the playoffs. The Big 12 is a tough conference. They, they play Peoria. They play normal community. It's, it's a very tough slate for the Irish. Um, the cool thing that they did, and they did this in week nine, they play at least one home game, Greg, a year at Dozier Park, which is the baseball stadium, the home of the single-A Peoria Chiefs. So where it, they, it's a cool, That's where they play state baseball as well. So it's cool. Yeah, that's yeah, a cool story. Right. So it, it, it's always a cool scene you know, um, how they get the field uh, oriented and you got the fans and everything. They make it a, a big night. So 
uh, a cool tradition there for for the Irish. Looking at a couple of their players, at least one guy, uh, Lawson Alwyn. He uh, he had 171 yards and a rush touchdown. He had two receiving touchdowns in that Week Nine loss. They lost to Peoria, a playoff team. So, you know, this is a team that that has struggled against better competition, um, but able to score. They are um, they're battle tested again in that conference defensively again they've lost three straight they've given up 40 plus in each each of those three games um and they were all against teams with winning records as kiwani will have so i think this is an opportunity for the boilermakers to get a win here because that offense has been a lot of fun to watch um you know brady clark will have the boys going so i do think that this will be a kiwani win um as long as they play disciplined and, and just do the things that they've been doing all season Yeah, you mentioned, uh, you know, Brady Clark, one of the guys that's, you know, been there all season, getting the job done as a leader for this Boilermaker team. And uh, Mitch, we need to go back and give a shout out to his accomplishment the other night. I got to make sure I find it and get it, get it correct here. But set the 107 year old school record by Nels, Uh, by Nels. He broke the record set by Nels Fugelsang, who played for the Boilermakers sure. from 1913 to 1916. Hey, we don't have enough Nels Fugelsang references on the pod. Yes, shout out to the Fugelsang family. <laughs> so Nels was a dynamic athlete for the Boilermakers back in the early 1900s. And he, let's see, the record was held. He had scored 212 points in his right. high school career. And uh, Clark breaks that record. And what's crazy is like Clark has got it on receiving touchdowns, rushing touchdowns, two point conversions, extra points, field goals. He's also had interceptions returned for touchdowns. And I'm trying yeah. to think if I missed anything else there. I mean, obviously he's thrown touchdown passes, but uh, maybe a sa- maybe he tackled someone for a safety. You know, oh, you just like, never know. Yeah. So anyway, quite an accomplishment to break a record that's over a hundred years old. That's an awesome story. And I don't know how old this particular record is, but he only needs eight points to um, become the season, the single season points record holder. So yeah, um, eight points, that's not much for, for him, the way that he plays. So fully anticipate him to to set this single season record as well by the, the end of this game on, uh, what do we say, Friday night? Yeah. Yep, Friday night. So um, obviously, you know, he leads the way along with uh, Duarte on that offensive side of the ball. But if they can put that defensive effort that I saw in the first half or for, you know, against Princeton. Yeah. They, yep. they, they could win this game and then move on. They, they, they were really flying to the ball and really limiting what Princeton could do. And obviously we know how good Princeton is offensively. So, and, and, and not just that, right. They, this is a team that had four shutouts on defense this year. Yep. Um, and, and another game against a Newman team that only had eight. So you're talking about five games this year on defense where they allowed eight or less. So yeah, this is, yeah. I think for me, I just look at that effort in the first half of that game. Now it didn't, it didn't work well in the entirety of the game, but I just look at a high end playoff team and a really good offense. And for at least a couple quarters, they really limited what Princeton could do. And yes, you're right. They've done it in several games, but in that one in particular with a playoff team, in Princeton. I, I wanted to make sure to, you know, mention that. Yeah. And just, just looking ahead, if they do come away with the win here on Friday, they would play the winner of Carterville and Harrisburg. I do not know anything about either of those two teams, but um, I, I think they've got a favorable draw here. You know, they, they, if they keep moving, they would maybe eventually run into Murfreesboro. Yeah. Um, who, I, who I think is a beatable team. So, you know, the, the way that Kiwani has been playing and where their draw sits, we could be looking at a run for the Boilermakers. Yeah, that could be a potential road trip there. Uh, I guess, yeah, between Carterville and either Harrisburg, that's a that's a long haul. Those are those are down down south, way far south in Illinois. I guess that's what you get when you're put in the south bracket. So, right again, again, we'll get into we'll get into you know the the travel logistics, and I am not complaining. I will never complain about travel. Um, I no. think it, uh, you know, there's just things that could be done better. So, right. but 
We will keep moving along. Mitch, before we jump into class 3A and then move down the way, we're going to pause real quick, thank our sponsors, be right back and jump in and get into the class 3A teams we got here. Brink Sportswear offers totally custom made-to-order football uniforms that allow coaches and athletic directors to take control of their brands. The uniforms are available in sublimated and tackle twill. They offer free digital mock-ups, free shipping on team orders, and free physical samples before you buy so you know exactly how you're spending your program's money. Uniform sets start at $99 for sublimated and $120 for tackle twill. You can find them on Twitter or go to brinksportswear.com. View from the West podcast is also sponsored by the Cupcake Cartel. Gourmet cupcakes that are made to order. Over 40 flavors, including wedding cake, lemon blueberry, strawberry milkshake, snickerdoodle, and Oreo. Perfect for weddings, birthdays, showers, fundraisers, or any event. You can find the Cupcake Cartel on Facebook. We thank them for their support. The Quad City's first and only fantasy football show, for fantasy's sake, has you all covered when it comes to all of your fantasy football needs. The guys come to you live every Sunday morning during the football season from 10 to 11.30. They've got the best analysis, rankings, DFS, and gambling advice between The Rock and Mississippi Rivers. So tune in to For Fantasy's Sake every Sunday during the football season from 10 to 11.30 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube. Welcome back. Let's get into Class 3A. We'll start with the Dupec Rivermen. They're the number five seed at seven and two. They will host the number 12 seed Oregon. That game Saturday, one o'clock in Pecatonica. Do we have it confirmed? It's it's in Pecatonica. Yep. All right. Mm-hmm. Playoff game there in Pecatonica. So Oregon, the Hawks out of the big Northern Conference. Brock Kundert, uh, who I believe has ties to the NUIC. And I know that Kyle's listening and screaming at his uh, at his computer because I can't remember what ties he has, either Polo or Aquin, but uh, I believe that's correct. So anyway, Brock Kunder, head coach. It is, it is Aquin. I, I was so close. There we All right, there we go. I, I, I had it, kind of. So the Hawks' 15th playoff appearance, first appearance, though, since 2014. So, Mitch, what do we know about the Oregon Hawks? They have heated sidewalks at their school. That's what I know about Oregon. What? <laughs> um, yeah. How do you know that? I've been to Oregon before. I actually drove through it on my way home from, uh, you know, the live NUIC show, but I did not see heated sidewalks. Uh, they don't glow orange. <laughs> well, glow. so how do you know this? That's what I'm asking. I know that they have them. I don't, I don't know how that works but i know that like in the winter they don't have snow on them because they're heated they're just like some sort of mechanism within the concrete or whatever material that is that they're they're heated all right that's that's the info you're here for everybody thanks mitch for that let's all right it's probably on the i probably just made that up <laughs> i don't think so though I, I know they used to who knows if they still do <laughs> anyway the Oregon hawks um They are the opposite of some of these other teams that we just talked about. They won three of their last four games to get into this field. Pretty good defense there in the big Northern. They, uh, the defense has allowed seven or less points four times this season. Now, again, that's, you're you're talking about a team that's lost four times, but this is the, this is the conference with Byron and Dixon and a lot of really good teams. So battle tested for sure. They, they bring a balanced attack. They they've got Logan Weems, who's a thousand yard rusher. They've got Jack Washburn, who's a thousand yard passer. He likes to spread the ball to, to a variety of different targets. Um, Griffin Marlott plays on both sides of the ball. So, you know, this is again a battle tested Oregon team um, that has a stingy defense. But, you know, that when they've played good teams, such as teams in their conference, they've shown that they can get. They, they could be exposed just a little bit. So for Dupec, you know, they bring that that really good pass first offense with, with Coop Hoffman. So, you know, th- this should be a really good game. Two teams that that bring similar, similarly good qualities to the field. You know, I think when I look at Oregon, I look at coming out of the big Northern Conference, right? I mean, that 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 is a good conference year in and year out. They're going to be challenged. They're going to be tested here. 
six playoff teams in the big Northern conference. Yeah, that's, there you go. That's, that's what I'm talking about. But I think, you know, I think the question always is, you know, can Dupec compete in class three a, and I think mm-hmm. we're waiting to see that big run from Dupec, but I think that they're, they're right on the doorstep, you know, and, and I, you know, I think that there's potential here when you start looking at the matchup, when, and you look at the, the way the bracket shapes up, I, I do think there's a chance they could make a run here. Now, if yeah. they do, if they do, it would be a more big Northern teams waiting for them. Potentially. You're probably going to see Stillman Valley in the second round. Yep. And then you'd right. see Byron in the quarterfinals. And, you yep. know, I think that that obviously looking way down the road, that would be a, t- a really tough matchup with Byron. But by that, I mean, you give yourself the opportunity, you know, if you, if you win these first two games. So they're potentially, you know, going through the big Northern gauntlet here if they want to make a run in Class 3A. Yeah, and again, they're coming out of the NUIC where they get battle tested every single week. So like you said, I, we want to see them have success here in the 3A playoffs because we like what they do during the regular season every, every year. They got a really good look at what competition might lie ahead in week nine when they played Altoff. We'll talk about them later on, but you know, they had that gutsy win over um over Forreston. They had that huge win against Fulton, which yeah. looks even better now. I mean, they they beat them by 32 in week seven. So um and played Lena Winslow tough. So this is a really good Dupec team. I really enjoyed watching them this year i'm really excited about their their week or sorry their round one matchup here against oregon because i do think they can win that game and as you mentioned there's opportunities in the second round to get a win as well and make a bit of a run what i think is important to mention in that win against fulton that you talked about is that that was one of those kind of rain soaked nights and they were able to go to the ground successfully you know they didn't they didn't have to rely on you know hoffman through the air as much and that was connor hughes really you know, stepping up on the ground. So I think this team can be, you know, this team is multidimensional. I think you get a lot of the headlines coming out of, you know, Hoffman at the quarterback position, but, you know, seeing Hughes step in and deliver when asked to do it is, is a big, I think a big sign for them. So, and, uh, and Jalen now. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Good call. Good call for sure. So, um, you know, a great matchup for this Northern, you know, side of the state up in the Rockford area to get these two schools that, you know, they're nearby each other, they're not far away, but they're in, you know, in different conferences to see this kind of crossover game in round one is, uh, is fun and exciting. So, so there you go. Pecatonica one o'clock on Saturday. That one should be a good one. Let's keep going down the bracket here. And again, I remind everybody, if you want to hear more of our big picture bracket talk and, you know, Mitch and I kind of looking through the brackets and what teams are seated where, and, uh, you know, just giving you more than just the matchups here. Go out to Twitter. We'll uh, we'll pin it up at the top of our page. But we went live on Spaces uh, on Saturday night after the brackets had been released, and it was kind of a a bonus instant reacts to the brackets. So that's a really good look at you know we read through all the names, all the seeds, and kind of how it you know how it all maps out. So let's keep looking at the in in the individual matchups here. Fifteen seeded Paxton Buckley Loda goes on the road to number two Princeton, who sits at eight and one. Saturday, one o'clock in the jungle. Mitch, you also went through and gave the weather forecast for every game. I haven't been giving that out yet, but most are overcast in mid fifties, almost all of them. So I, I did notice that you haven't been mentioning that. I, that did not go by me, but it also <laughs> wasn't that hard because it wasn't that hard because yeah, most most of the games are the same. So if you've been listening this far and you wanted to know what the weather was for the other games, it was overcast in mid fifties, just like this one. That's right. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, Mitch, tell us, what do we know? What do we need to know about Paxton Buckley Loda? Yeah, the Panthers out of the Illini Prairie Conference. They are coached by Josh Pritchard. This is their 22nd appearance in the playoffs, their ninth consecutive. They fell last year in round one. Now, reverting back to things that we talked about earlier, this is another team that has lost three of their last four heading into the playoffs. Um, Defensively, they have they have shown that they can be scored on. There's only one game where they haven't allowed double digit points. That's not a particular stat you want to have going up against the Princeton team in round one. They do have a pretty dynamic running back. Uh, Robert Boyd meets 
He ran for 1,400 yards and 23 touchdowns last year as a sophomore. He's got roughly about the same stats this year as a junior, and now they use him a little bit more out of the backfield as a receiving threat. Uh, Connor Vaughn is their quarterback. So they do have a, a nice offense to watch, but I nothing scares me here, I, I don't think. The way that Princeton has been playing all season, um, including and ever since that, that loss to Morrison, they just have not really had a game where they were slowed down too much or didn't look like they were in complete command of the game. So um, as, as we talked about, they went on to win their sixth straight track Mississippi title. So, you know, this is a Princeton team that is, has played really well this regular season. They are an experienced team when it comes to playoffs. And I expect the, this to be another win uh, for them this year. Yeah. It's their fifth consecutive playoff appearance. Mitch, we've talked about their defense, six shutouts this season, three straight to end the regular season. They've only right. allowed they've only allowed 42 points all year. It's crazy. That yeah, that's that. And 20 22 of them came against Morrison. Wow, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's crazy that that number, you know, that defensive number that they've put up. And yep. the, you know, Mitch, you know it's playoff time in the jungle when the end zones are painted and ready to go. They're painted by Ryan Pearson's dad. Tom, he comes every year and paints the end zones. And man, they look phenomenal. They look so good every year. Yep. So shout out to Kevin Hieronymus from the Bureau County Republican. He tweeted it out earlier today. I love it. It's, it's such a great think, look and it, it's cool. I think he also said that maybe Coach Pearson had put a little bit of that in his hair. So that might be a look we're looking <laughs> forward to. Uh, well, we, need to check, afternoon. we need to check that out then. All right. That'll be, all, that'll be all over Tiger Central Live, no question. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, yeah, this matchup, you know, a really good experienced Princeton team going up against a 5-4 and four Paxton Buckley Loda. I would think you got you to figure Princeton's the favorite in this one to move along. And, you know, you start looking down the way, it'd be a potential matchup against another big northern team in North Boone or potentially Monmouth Roseville out of the Three Rivers. So, um, I think they're going to play Monmouth Roseville. Okay, well, there you go. Well, <laughs> <laughs> as long as we're talking about it, let's get into that matchup. Number 10. Well, real, real quick. Yes. Real quick. We talked about this on Saturday that um, Princeton's draw um, looks good. It could lead to a quarterfinal matchup with Lombard Montini. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's, yep, I was also looking at that. We talked about it in the uh, in the bracket instant reacts that I've referenced that's out out there on Twitter. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we talked about IC Catholic. They've now bumped up to class 5A who's, or 4A. Who steps in into this class 3A field? It's Lombard Montini. I mean, a traditional playoff powerhouse. I don't, I think most people listening already know that, but they haven't been in the playoffs for a few years. Now they're battle tested this year and they're in and their record is six and three. I got to figure that they're going to be out there in the quarterfinals. If Princeton can make a run, that's going to be an intriguing matchup in the quarterfinals. If both teams can make it out that far. How many state championships does Montini have, Greg? Oh, off the top of my head. I, I don't know. No, no, this is why we're playing the guessing game. Okay. Um, I'll guess five, six. Ooh, so close. Six. Six? Oh, man, I was going to say six. Then I, then I backtracked. Should have went, went with my gut instinct there. Yep. All right. Six. All right. Well, getting back into the first round, Monmouth Roseville, the 10 seed at five and four, going on the road to Poplar Grove, North Boone at six and three. They're the seven seed. This game also Friday night, 7 p.m. at North Boone High School. Weather, overcast, low 50s, not mid 50s, low no. 50s. So plan accordingly. Reasons. Plan mm -hmm. accordingly. Now, where is this? This is a research you got from where? Like the Weather Channel app or where, where are we talking here? My cell phone. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Whatever yeah. app, whatever app comes default on an iPhone. Okay. See, I, I'm a Weather Channel uh, guy. Weather Channel app guy. I feel like I feel like it's connected because I feel like you can like click on something and it goes to the Weather Channel. So maybe could be could be. Uh, growing up, did your parents watch the Weather Channel? Yes. Yeah, my parents used to leave it on. It's like it would just be on. Well, you, yeah. Sometimes you get some of these like nostalgia Instagram accounts that yes. will like play yes. like 
what those screens used to look like. Cause it, you know, back in the day, it wasn't programming television on, on the weather channel. I don't even think there was people on the weather channel. No. It was just maps. It yep. was just maps and music. That was all it was. <laughs> oh man. Maps and music. The story of the weather channel. That sounds like a riveting right. documentary. That's right. All right. All right. I would watch that. All right. So where are we at here? Are we talking North Boone. Mitch, give me some info on North Boone, the Vikings. I've been to North Boone. Okay. Um, that was our round one game my junior year. Uh, they were, were they the top seed? I think they were the top seed that year. We lost by a point. Don't need to talk about it, but I have been there. So the Vikings out of the big Northern as well, coached by Ryan Kelly. This is their 21st appearance in the playoffs. They lost uh, in 3A round one in 2021. They were the 1A runner up in 92. I don't know if they still do this, but they did this when I was, when I played up there, they've got trees that surround the field. And they're, they, they like come out of the trees as their entrance. So nice. All right. Um, it, I, I bet if they still do it, I bet it looks pretty cool at night. So it, it looked cool when they did it, when I saw it. So um, they've got some good players. They, they've, they've got a handful of guys. They've got a really big line, really talented line. Hunter Chamberlain is, is probably their, uh, their best one. He's 6'3", 325. He's got a handful of D3 offers. Jimmy Ellsworth is another one that, that's on that line. Jack Christensen, he's a senior quarterback, converted from running backs. So they do use him in a dual threat type of way. Um, Greg, you probably remember this name from last year. Uh, Cole Dutch, the receiver, he's been a, a dynamic playmaker for them the past couple of years. So they throw it around. Um, Coach Adelson mentioned to us that kind of plays like Orion and Sherrard. And so this could have potentially be a good tune-up for Roosevelt having played teams like that because uh, their, their styles are, are similar. Yeah, I heard that interview and thought that was interesting that, you know, back to back weeks at the end of the season, they're going up against teams that throw the ball around a lot, you know, had quarterbacks that were really, you know, not afraid to air it out and were really going to attack you through the air. So, you know, if that's a good way to kind of gear up for this game against North Boone, they're going to probably do something similar. So, um, and, and, and played really well for that matter, you know, um, yep. a bit of a shootout against Orion. I, I think Roseville was up quite a bit in that game before Orion started to make a comeback. And then um, they, they took care of Sherrard there in week nine. So yeah, good tune up, but they also played really well. So Mitch, I didn't realize this until you typed it out in the notes. Ma Monmouth Roseville finishes the season at five and four. All of their losses came to teams that finished eight and one. Including three in a row, Morrison, Rock Ridge, and Kiwani. Wow. The other one, that is the other, one, the other one being Princeton in week one. Yes, you talk about like strength of schedule. I mean, we, you know, we credited the the Big Northern for being a tough conference and obviously they are with, you know, six playoff teams. But man, that's that's crazy. Four losses all to teams that finished 8 and 1. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I that just really caught me off guard. So, they averaged 42 yep. points per game in the last 2 weeks after coming off three straight losses. So, they really are riding a wave of momentum here. Peyton Thompson you know, can he get loose to kind of pave the way in this one? I think it's, is it Tyler Finnicum, who's the other name we've read a lot this year for the Titans? So, you know, I think it's, you know, this is, um, you know, Monmouth Roseville team that seems to be, you know, finding their footing, playing some good football recently. Yeah, and their defense has shown signs that that they can stop offenses. I, it doesn't happen as much as I would hope to. It certainly has the past couple of weeks, but you look at those games, they, they let up 40 to Princeton, 41 to Morrison, 42 to Kiwani. So I, I, I want to see that tightened up a little bit better, like when they played against Erie Prophetstown or, or BV when they only allowed, you know, 14 points. Um, Sherrard, they only allowed 18 points. So I, I think that's going to be the key here. If their defense can come to play and stop that offense that we talked about for, for North Boone, I think we're looking at a win for Mount Roseville and a potential rematch with Princeton in round two. I was just going to say, I want that. I want that rematch against Princeton there for Monmouth Roseville. I'd love to get, you know, that one. Two teams from our, you know, coverage area meeting up in the second round would be excellent. So good luck to the Titans. Get the job done. And we'll be talking about you again next week for sure. All right, Mitch, is it class 2A? Time for class 2A here? I believe it is. All right, let's get into it. Number nine, Taylor Rockridge, eight and one going on the road to number eight Westville, also eight and one. 
So here we go. And I want to preface any of this before we get into it. We are not complaining or frustrated that Rockridge has to travel. That's not my beef. I get it. it. And, and it's not with Westville either. Not with no, Westville at all. No, no. I, I'm, not, I'm not mad that Rockridge has to travel. What's frustrating to me is the IHSA always insists that 1 through 32, we can't do that because travel would be too much. There, there'd be too much travel. But it's happening anyway. We saw it last year with Geneseo going down to Carterville. We see it this yep. year with Rockridge traveling across the state to Westville. My biggest beef here is that not necessarily that they have to travel that far. It's that they're on the road in general. As an eight and one school, I get this, it. As an this eight, is the number, this is the number six ranked team in two A, and they're a nine seed in their own bracket. Yeah, that does not make sense. I, it, like the two A North is a loaded bracket, and you know we talk about that, and that that's great that there's a lot of talented teams in that bracket, but they shouldn't all be there. They should be spread out throughout a one through thirty two bracket. If we want to get this right, they should be spread out throughout one through 32. And here's the ultimate irony, Mitch. We reached out to Kyle Kampmeyer, who does great work with projections through NUICfootball.com. He does projections the same way that Susie does. And I asked him, I said, hey, I got to know if this 2A class was seated one through 32, where would Rockridge end up? What would happen? Yeah. Yeah. In the one through 32 field, they would be hosting Mercer County. So... Right. So instead, instead we go one through 16 and Mercer County is going on the road to Wilmington and Rockridge is going on the road to Westville. So you tell me, where's the travel coming from? You know, and I get it. This is an isolated incident, you know, an isolated, we're calling out, you know, these isolated matchups, but you start looking down the way, some of the travel that Kyle said would have existed in the one through 32 versus what we already have. And it wasn't that much different. So right, I, yeah, a, a couple of those scenarios, right? If, if Seneca, or sorry, if Quincy Notre Dame would have to go to Seneca, two hundred and forty-six miles. Uh, if Chester were going to, to Farmington, two hundred and forty-two miles. If, if Breezy had to go to Moments, that's two thirty-eight. You know, Nashville to Bismarck, two fourteen. This this game, Rock Ridge at Westville, the way it is now, is two twenty-two. So yeah, you're if the travel is going to be the same no matter how you slice it, then at least make it so that we're going one through 32 and you have the best chance of the two best teams meeting further down the road. Maybe Rockridge and Westville are the two, two of the best teams in two A. I'd love to see that matchup in the quarterfinals, not the first round. Yep. Yeah. I just, I can't see. I can't we're see. Gonna a, this in, we're going to get into this in one A too. It's the same thing. It's just, it's another yep. example of why, why can't we just do it? Why can't we just go to one through 32 because we're traveling no matter what? Well, and it's just, yeah, we're traveling no matter what. So the reasoning, the rationale behind holding on to this one through 16 doesn't, doesn't make sense. The argument doesn't hold water to me. Um, yeah. And uh, looking at rock Ridge as the number nine seed, I just, I can't buy the fact that there are eight teams in class two, a better than, you know, you, you can't tell me there's eight teams in this bracket better than rock Ridge. I'm not sure I'm buying that. So now that being said, they got to go out and prove it. They got to win. They got to get this win here on the road against Westville Saturday, two o'clock Memorial field in Westville weather outlook, Mitch 60 degrees, 40% chance of rain. So interesting, good homework, good research there. What do we know about Westville? The tigers, they look like Clemson, correct? Yes. I've also been to Westville, Greg. Um, that would have been the 2006 season. Okay. Um, Morrison, Morrison played them in, this was after I graduated. Yeah, I was going to say, this was, this was when I was um, working locally. Yeah, so this was the year after I graduated. Morrison went to Westville for a semifinal matchup, um, lost to Westville. Morrison went for two with like, I don't know, seven seconds left in the game, something like that, and they got stopped short, and Westville went on to the state uh, championship game where they ended up losing to Royal Forsyth, I think. Yeah. Um, so yes, I've been to Westville. It is a hall. Yep. Um, the Tigers out of the Vermilion Valley Conference. Uh, Guy Goodlove, who I think is probably going to be a Hall of Fame coach when he's 
when it's all said and done. He's been around there for a long time. He's got a lot of wins here. Their 16th appearance, they lost in round one last year. Uh, as mentioned, they were the two-way runner-ups in 06 and 07. Pretty dynamic offense, 40 points per game, but didn't play a team that finished with a winning record. Hang on. Now i got to look this up, so I think my note was wrong. Okay. Um, I'll forgive you because you put in a yeah. lot of notes in this uh, in this yeah. spreadsheet. So, so they, um, it's, sorry, it was week three. They haven't played a team that finished with a winning record since they lost in week three to Moments. Now their first two games, they beat Salt Fork, finished seven and two, and they beat uh, Bismarck Henning, Rossville Alvin, who finished seven and two. So they they did start the year against really good opponents and they won those games minus the moments game. But then after that, their quality of competition dropped off a little bit and those numbers on offense really started to pop. I mean, they didn't score in the final six weeks of the season. They didn't score under 47 points. So, um, but they, they allowed right under, I think it's 188 points defensively. So they, they can be scored on and that's, where I see is Rock Ridge for an opening for them to play, especially in conditions like that. Um, similar to the Morrison game, right? Can you can you get Westville maybe out of their rhythm, as Rock Ridge has shown that they can do, and they're they're a team that is equipped to play in those sort of conditions. But um, they've got uh, Drew uh, Witkowski. Witkowski, he's a dual threat quarterback. Uh, saw some clips of him; he's fun to watch. Trent McMaster's kind of scores a field but greg the biggest thing i found out about uh, about westville they have a rivalry game with georgetown ridge farm chrisman which is a mouthful they play for the coal bucket greg yeah i i i want to know more about that that's interesting yeah you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta look it up i don't know what a coal bucket is it's pretty <laughs> self-explanatory i suppose but it's just like this cast iron coal bucket thing Nice sitting on top of a, of a platform. So um, it's a big deal with, oh. with Georgetown Ridge, Ridge farm, Christman. So um, yeah, neat looking trophy, but you know, again, for rock Ridge, it's a tough draw, right? But, but I think it's, it's I think it's a tough, it's a tough draw in the fact that, you know, as an eight and one team, you got to go that far away, you know, so right. like logistically, it's not a great fit, but you, the way you described that they can put up some points, but they can give up some points. I think that kind of plays into Rockridge's hands a little bit. I think Rockridge's right. defense is good enough to slow down an offense like that. And if you get slow them down just enough and you can score some points there against a defense that may be a little vulnerable, I think that that's a good recipe, right? For the Rockets. Right. They Westfield did not have a game where they allowed single digits. See, every, so yeah, every, yeah. Every opponent they scored, and even even in those six weeks to to end of the season where they played all teams that finished with a losing record, they gave up 10, 28, 19, 21, 16, 24. So good offense, no question about it. Really good offense, but a defense that can be scored on. Yep. Yep. And I don't know that they've played a defense such as Rock Ridges, uh, other than maybe the moments game. Um, and even those those first two games against Salt Fork and, and Bishop Henning, those were both by a score. So in games that they've played against tough tough competition, their offense hasn't really been there, and they've given up points. So that's where I think this game, with the weather, falls into Rock Ridge's hands. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I think, you know, defense, defense travels, you know, and the come playoff time, defense is what, you know, a lot of teams can hang their hat on. I, I do think that that field is, is multi-turf, so – the rain might not affect them too much. Okay. It might stop the passing game. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Rock Ridge has proven that, you know, Cohen Schwagen can run the ball too. So, you know, it, it should be a fun game. This, this should be a really fun game, again, that I would have liked to have seen in the quarterfinals. Yeah. Um, but either, either way, we get this game early, a tough test for Rock Ridge. I, I, I think the recipe is there for them to win and then potentially meet up with Seneca in round two. Yeah, well, I was going to say, and they'd have them at home. If it's a Seneca, you know, matchup with Seneca. Okay, I, I, I was asked about that. Yes. How, how does that work? What's the rule there? Because I so, thought a team had to play, if, if they had hosted two games, that's when it would 
change the rule, but what is that rule? I think basically if you go on the road in the first round and if you play a team in the second round that's already had a home game, so if, if like in this case, Seneca has already had a home game, Rock Ridge has okay. not had a home game yet, so it goes to Rock Ridge. The team who has had okay. less home games, I believe, is that's, good. that's, that's at least good for the first round. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's good to know. So yeah, good luck to the Rockets here. Cause I think that, you know, they get this one. I think they have a good shot against Seneca too. I think they could, they could make a little yeah. run here in this, in this bracket. So 20, right. 24, 24th appearance for the Rock Ridge Rockets here. Third straight. Yeah. Yep. They've become a, you know, a regular in, in this, in this two, a field. So, yep. All right. The 12, 12- speech. Speaking of regulars, let's talk yeah. about Alito. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, Mercer County and the team they're playing, Wilmington. Yeah. Right. Alito, yeah. Mercer County goes on the road. They're six and three, the number 12 seed. They go to number five seeded Wilmington, who's eight and one on the season. This game will be Saturday, four o'clock in Wilmington. Mitch is a team in Wilmington that always kind of hovers the line of 3A, 4A, or sorry, 3A or 2A. This year, right. they fall into this 2A field. They're a battle-tested team. Their only loss coming in week one to Seneca, the team we just referenced. So that's that's kind of Seneca's calling card. That's their, you know, marquee win of the year. But Wilmington has rolled along since. They played really well. Like we said, this game Saturday, 4 p.m. Weather, overcast, mid-50s. So we're back to that, you know, standard. Yeah. A lot of teams will see that. So, yeah. Yeah, cool. so this, this Wilmington team is, I guess they finished the season ranked as the AP number three in 3A and then dropped down to 2A. So this is a good program. This is a really good team. This is their 27th straight playoff appearance. Um, they, they won the 2A title just a couple seasons ago in 2A. They won the 3A title in 2014. So, um, yeah, this is Coach, Coach Reince. They've only had one losing season with him as head coach, and that was in his first season way back in 1994. That is impressive. I mean, I knew Wilmington's yeah, so. been good, but that is really impressive. Yep. So uh, uh, 39 points per game. They they run the ball a lot. I do not think they pass much. So, you know. We well, like no, that. but they're a pretty – I mean, as far as only running the ball, they're a pretty dynamic offense in terms of running. I mean, I think they do a lot of things yeah. to confuse you and a lot of things to really catch you – you know, they, they do a really good job up front. Yeah. A lot, a lot, a lot of misdirection, um, a lot of play action, you know? So yeah, Kyle, Kyle Farrell is their top running back. He had a seven touchdown performance earlier this year against Manteno. I believe I'm Man- saying that Mantino. right. Mantino. Mantino. Uh, I typed it wrong. Uh, Ryan Ketman is another running back that they use quite a bit. So yeah, like you mentioned, they spread the ball around um, and you know what they're going to do. And it's, it's really, really hard, hard to stop. So. This is a good Wilmington program here, and uh, it'd be a challenge for Mercer County, no, no question. Yeah, you know, on the flip side of things, when you're looking at Mercer County, they've qualified for the playoffs every season as Mercer County. That's 14 out of 14. 27th consecutive appearance between Alito and Mercer County. They have four state titles in their school history. They have one at Mercer County. That was in 2012, and I believe Tanner Matlick was the quarterback for that team. So, he certainly knows head coach as a head coach now certainly knows what it's like to be part of a championship program. I think what's, you know, you look at for Mercer County is just, can they find that consistent play that high end consistent play that we we've seen flashes of, we've seen some good performances and we've seen some games that, you know, left us kind of scratching our heads. Like we, we were hoping for a little bit more um, interesting to note that um you know, Coach Matlick thinks that they are, you know, the healthiest they've been all year is now. And so if they can kind of turn that corner and be healthy with Colby Cox leading the way on this diverse offense and really getting guys in the right spots to make plays. And I think the other thing that has to be mentioned is the deeper you get into the season, the more experience Matlick has as a head coach and the more experience these guys have with him play calling, right? I think that mm-hmm. all factors in and I. I think what's what's fascinating in this matchup is you have, you know, Tanner Matlick in his first playoff appearance as a head coach. And on the on the flip side, you know, Jeff Reince has been there how many times? You know, 30 some. Right. So it's just, you know, it's it's a contrast there as far as, you know, nothing is gonna catch 
Coach Reince off guard on the playoff day. He's seen everything over the years, you know. But for Mercer County, it's a little different look. They've been there as a program, but not, you know, with with this head coach. So that that does kind of make it a tough draw when you're when you're talking about going on the road to Wilmington. Right. Yeah. Four game win streak for the Golden Eagles. So they, they've played much better than they did in their losses in weeks four and five to Farmington and Knoxville. So, um, you know, I, I want to see that defense be as, as tight as they were um, here in the last four weeks, minus the West Hancock game where they gave up 32. But again, that's, that's a pretty pass happy offense. So we'll be seeing that against Wilmington for sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, good luck to the Mercer County Golden Eagles there as they travel up to Wilmington. We'll keep moving down the bracket here. The 10 seed, Knoxville, 7-2. and two. They go on the road to number 7 seed, Moments, at 8-1. and one. That game is noon in Moments. Overcast mid-50s is the forecast. So a noon kickoff is a little bit different here for the playoffs. Yeah. Well, what do we know? Um, what do we know about Moments here, Mitch? So the Redskins, out of uh, also the Vermilion Valley, they are coached by Wayne Walker. This is their 21st playoff appearance. They didn't make it last year. They they did qualify in 21, and I think they lost in round one that year. So this year, the Redskins are averaging 35 points a game. Pretty stingy on defense, too. They've only given up. They averaged about 12 points per game given up. Only loss was to uh, Bismarck Henning in week seven. That was a 35-19 contest. So. Yeah, this is a good moments team. This was a team that was kind of bordering maybe going to 1A. I, I think it, at certain points of the year, it might look like they might have dropped, but uh, they stay in 2A here. Got a couple guys here. Terrence Ottman and Marcello Drain are their running backs. So, um, again, putting up 35, 35 a night behind those two guys and a pretty good defense here. Yeah, for this Knoxville team, it, you know, it all comes down to – you know, kind of riding the ship. They, you know, they were seven and zero, and they've had two tough losses here to end their season. So it's just a matter of you know bouncing back and kind of getting back on the right path. When when Knoxville was up and rolling mid season, especially you know we just talked about um, Mercer County, their win over Mercer County was you know dominant, a dominating performance. They really controlled that game. That was a great win for them. But you know, it, it hasn't been there in the last couple of weeks. They fell short to Fulton. And then they fell short again to Farmington. So two really good playoff teams, but right. not, you know, not what you want heading into the postseason here. Right. Exactly. They, they need to get Nolan McClay and Mitchell Parrish really involved here and get them to, to establish that run game and control the clock and, and play the way that the blue bullets typically play. So yeah, still, still have a lot of questions about that Fulton game. They played better against Farmington, I think. Um, so yeah, can they, can they continue to start playing the way that they did the first seven weeks? Um, and, uh, this is a winnable game for Knoxville. There's no question in my mind about that. So they just have to play the way that they know and just not the way that they have been the past two weeks. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, if you show up in this one, it's a, you know, a, an opponent that you're not, that's not familiar with you. If you can show up and really play that tough physical football up front, like we know Knoxville can do really create some holes for those running backs that you referenced. Yeah. I think that this is a game that Knoxville could really come in and really, you know, prove how tough they can be. Not what they have been the past two weeks, but how really good they can be. So, you know, good luck to the blue bullets in that one. And speaking of, you know, the rest of the way in the LLC here on that big side of things, one of the teams Knoxville just lost to in week nine Farmington, they finished the year eight and one. They're the sixth seed. They host, Bismarck, Henning, Rossville, Elvin. This game Saturday, three o'clock in Farmington. Weather overcast, mid fifties. That's uh, that was a copy and paste for a lot of these games. <laughs> yes, it sure was. Well, Mitch, um, the Blue Devils from uh, yeah, Bismarck, Henning, Rossville, Elvin. Yeah, uh, the, I think the third team we've mentioned out of the Vermilion Valley. Um, coached by Mark Dodd. This is their 13th consecutive playoff appearance, 25 overall in school history. Uh, Coach Dodd has been there since 07, had a lot of success here. 10 and 1 each of the past two seasons. So this is a quality program. Another good season for them, as you mentioned, coming in at 7 and 2. 
Uh, in their week nine win over Oakwood, they got a quarterback, Carson Stevenson, 379 yards and six touchdowns. Yeah. So this is certainly a, a passing attack offense. Uh, Chaz Dubois catching four passes for 135 yards, three touchdowns. Aiden Ingram had five for 107 and two. Logan Hughes, 58 yards. Anderson Thomas. So they, they like to spread the ball out quite a bit. Um, probably a la a West Hancock offense that I think Farmington played against this year, right? Um, yes, they would have. Yep. And Farmington yes, got in week, in week two. In week two. Yep. Um, and, and so, yeah, this will be. It's overcast. It's not going to rain, so we we should see that that Blue Devil offense uh, playing probably just like this, throwing the ball quite a bit. So, Farmington for on defensive side of the ball, they'll have to be sharp. They've been pretty sharp most of the year other outside that that loss to Kiwani or sorry to Anwan Weathersfield um but you know holding Knoxville to 19 and you know holding Mercer County to 13 you know some of their performances this this year have been really really good on defense so they'll need to do that again here in round one yeah I look for you know defensively can they make a few stops against this uh you know this Blue Devils offense and I think you look at the numbers you just rattled off they're impressive. And I'm sure that, you know, they could throw the ball around, you know, offensively, but Farmington is going to be a tougher team than Oakwood was, you know, Oakwood finished right. the year at four and five. So yeah. you're, you know, tougher matchup here now in coming into the playoffs. And this, I mean, offensively, this could be a fun game to watch, right? Cause Farmington throws the ball around a little bit too. When you talk about the wheelwright brothers, Lane wheelwright, yeah. a quarterback, his brother, Jack wheelwright at wire or at uh, running back. But then Logan Utt and Jack Gronwald at wide receiver. So I think that this could be a fun one to watch, you know, if it's not going to rain and there's, you know, potential for these two teams to, you know, throw the ball around at each other and see, you know, what kind of offense can really, you know, prevail here and play well. Overall, you know, balanced offense for the Farmers. Only stumble coming against, you know, like you said, Anon Weathersfield. But otherwise, they've looked really good. And they, they were the, you know, conference champs on that large school side for a reason. Yep. Been really impressed with the farmers this year. So um, like their chances here at home um, again, just have to play, play discipline when you're playing a passing attack offense, but with, with a wheel wheel rights. Um, and like you said, uh, Grunwald and uh, this is a really, really good Farmington offense too. So it could be a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, when you start looking around that, um, that two, a, North bracket. We referenced it when we started here, but it, it's a loaded, I mean, it's a loaded bracket. It's a lot of talented teams. Obviously that's why rock Ridge ended up going on the road as an eight and one team. Seneca is the number one seed. And then you have downs tri Valley. Who's undefeated. Maroa Forsyth is undefeated. It's yep. Bloomington central Catholic. We haven't mentioned yet. So there's a lot of really good football, you know, that's going to be played on this half of the bracket. I'm really interested to see how our teams stack up, you know, which, which one of our local teams can show up and perform here. And I think our, the teams we're talking about here have as good a chance as any has taken down some of those big, you know, big heavy hitters. Yeah. I don't disagree with anything you said. I think this two, a North only rivals or is the closest rival. I should say to the one, a North, this is a, a lot of good programs, a lot of good teams. Again, when you have a 10 seed at seven and two, a lot of quality football in this uh, in this North bracket. So yeah, looking forward to seeing how this this entire first round shakes out here in two way North. Yep. Again, for that big picture bracket talk, go to Twitter. We'll pin it up at the top of our page. You can find our uh, um, what do we call it? Spaces. We were we were in Twitter Spaces, yeah. and uh, you know we went live as a bonus instant reacts breaking down the brackets. Mitch, we better get through class 1A because my voice is uh, starting to fail me here. So we better we better keep chugging along. We yeah. got class 1A, a lot of teams to talk about. Then we'll get into eight man. Oh, you can hear it. It's starting to go on me. Give oh, me boy. the uh, give me the class 1A. Um, you know, the 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 top seed. We know them. We know, well, we know yeah. who they are. Give <laughs> us give us the look here. We'll we'll run through this one pretty quick. Lena Winslow, the top seed at nine and oh. They'll play a 16 seed in Rockford Lutheran, who comes in at five and four. Uh, before we get into that, Greg, one order of business here since we weren't talking about 
uh, the results from week nine on this episode. Again, you can go back to the instant reacts from Friday night. Uh, but a name that we've talked about all season, have not awarded um, a, a Matthewson's mini helmet to just yet, but probably had eight other performances that were worthy of it throughout the year. But uh, Gage Dunker goes for 273 yards and four touchdowns to cap off yet another uh, undefeated season for Lena Winslow in that win over Forreston. So Gage Dunker with that performance will be our week nine Matthewson's mini helmets player of the week. We'll get a helmet uh, personalized for Gage and sent to him uh, to document this incredible performance. One of the many he had all season. So congratulations to Gage Dunker and the Panther team on uh, this number one seed and a week nine win. Yeah, you know, when we started this Matthewson's Mini Helmets Player of the Week, we kind of thought that we we kind of thought somebody from Lena Winslow, probably Gage Dunker, would be in the conversation. It took until week nine, but like you said, he's probably had multiple performances. We was probably worthy of it. Here, if you're looking for the perfect gift for your high school football player, check out Matthewson's Mini Helmets. They offer totally custom mini helmets or decals for your school. Find them on Facebook or Twitter. So congratulations to Gage Dunker. He is our Matthewson's Mini Helmets Player of the Week for Week 9. Nine winners this year. We awarded one once every week. So he has a customized View from the West Mini Helmet on the way. Again, check out Matthewson's Mini Helmets on Facebook and on Twitter. So yeah, I'm not sure how much we need to really get into this one. Two o'clock in Lena. I think they're going to survive this one. I think we're going to be talking about Lena Winslow once again next week. Yeah, this will be over by four o'clock, I think. Um, just real quick, the Crusaders are also out of the big northern. They lost last year, if you remember, to Fulton. Um, they were one of the final, or sorry, they won their final two games to make it into this this playoff field. They've got a quarterback in Gavin Sanders. He had 179 yards, 75 yards rushing and two touchdowns in their week nine game. But uh, truth be told, nothing about Rockford Lutheran scares me at all. So, um, for Lee Wynn, their, their quest to become the first 1A team to win four consecutive state titles begins on Saturday at 2 p.m., and they would be looking to wrap up their seventh title in school history. So got to win the first one to do that, and they will absolutely do that. Yep, they've, uh, they've been impressive year in and year out, and uh, I'm guessing that we will uh, continue to see them, you know, impressed throughout this playoff run here. So we'll see. See who they're matching up with if they, you know, if they get by that one, see who they match up with in round two. Potential for a Forest and rematch here. They're the number eight seed at seven and two. They will host Marquette, Ottawa Marquette at seven and two as well. This one, a Friday night kick, seven o'clock in Forreston. So Mitch, the Crusaders from the Chicago Land Prairie Conference, head coach Tom Yupst making his 11th consecutive trip to the playoffs here. I mean, Marquette and Forreston are familiar with each other. They've run into each other three times in the postseason over the last 10 years, including the state semifinals in 2016. Forreston has gone 3-0 in those matchups. So, you know, uh, a good matchup if you're the Cardinals because they've had success here for sure. Yeah, and and you know more about Ottawa Marquette's season than I do, but when you're an independent team, your quality of, of opponents comes into question just a little bit. Certainly not a question that we have with Forrest in. Well, Marquette's um, not independent this year. Oh, they they're not? Have been. See, that's no. how much I know about Ottawa Marquette. Now they're in the Chicago Prairie, the Chicago Land Oh, Prairie that's Conference. right. Yeah, 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 that's right. Okay. So Seneca, St. Bede, uh, Dwight, um, Ridgewood out of Norridge, who is also a playoff team at five and four. So, but again, I it's not. So forget anything I just said. Right? <laughs> forget anything I just said about Ottawa Marquette. But well, to your point, that conference is not challenging Marquette the same way that, you know, Forrest and C's in the NUIC. That's for right. sure. Yeah. So yeah, that, that's a hard bar to clear. So, well, yeah. um, but, but anyway, you know, Forrest and coming off of what back-to-back -back losses, right. Um, lost to Dupac and then lost to Lena Winslow. So, yep. you know, they're, they're going to try and write the ship here for sure. They need to, they got to get Caleb Saunders, Owen Mulder, Mike and Nelson. They got to get those main guys going um i did not look at the weather forecast here greg but i can only imagine it's going to be 50 mid 50s and overcast <laughs> um so you know if 
even even in even in the game against Dupac in, in week eight where it was just raining like crazy. Um they were still moving the ball. They just they just could not get into the end zone, understandably. So um, you know, maybe another step back against Lena offense didn't do a whole lot, but again, you can't really compare that too much when you're talking about Lena Winslow. So I, I think they can do it here. I think they can get their offense going again. Um they probably maybe looking ahead a little bit, wanting to get that rematch with, with Lena Wenzel. We've seen that happen before and, and Forsen's come out on top. So maybe they've got that in the back of their mind. So it won't be easy. Ottawa Marquette's seven and two. Like you mentioned, they've, they've played some good teams, but in the end, I think Forsen might come away with this one. Yeah. On the uh, NUIC playoff preview show, obviously, you know, I'm talking to people who are, you know, fans of the Northwest upstate Illini. I tried right. to, and I am too. I am too. I tried to, uh, Tried to give a plug for a potential Marquette upset. Those guys weren't buying it. So, yeah. <laughs> so I understand. I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, you look at this Marquette team, you know, what Coach Yups does. They're not, there's not going to be many surprises, right? They do basically what Forreston and what some of the good, you know, NUIC teams do. They try, or they try to do with that, with the same recipe for success. They want to control the ball. They want to control the clock. They're going to run right at you and they're going to try to capitalize on mistakes, right? How many times have you heard that about? And UIC football teams. So right. I think, do they have the horses this year to match up with an NUIC team? I don't know. They got fullback Jacob Smith, running back Peyton Gutierrez, and uh, Pete McGrath, Grant Dose. Several, you know, running backs that can do the job. That's usually a calling card for Marquette. But um, yeah, on the flip side, this is a Forreston team that rarely turns the ball over unless Mitch tweets it out and then it jinxes them. And then they do. That wasn't me. That <laughs> was the Dupec radio team who said that. Not okay. Me. Okay. Fair enough. All right. So uh, they don't turn the ball over very often, and they've proven over the years in games that Coach Janicki coaches, they can really take over the game clock and really control the game if they need to. Will they need to in this one? They, they got enough explosive weapons that maybe they won't need to do that, but they certainly can, you know, outpower you and you know out physical their you know way to a win so Mm -hmm. um yeah i think as much as my loyalties lie with the crusaders i i do think forreston has a you know a great shot to move on here and face lena winslow in the second round so let's keep moving down the way in this uh you know 1a north bracket that is essentially the view from the west invitational it's all of our teams up here so the number four seed anawan weathersfield at eight and one they're hosting Deer Creek Mackinac at five and four. This same game will be Saturday, one o'clock at Weathersfield. Mitch, have you ever been to a playoff game at Weathersfield? No, but I have been to Deer Creek Mackinac. Oh, there you go. See, and I have not been to DMAC. So, man, a game, a game at Anawan Weathersfield on a Saturday is is awesome. It's just great. Yep. It's a great atmosphere. Yep. Uh, so looking at Mackinac, the Chiefs out of the heart of Illinois Large Conference. Um, they are no stranger to the playoffs. This is their 30th time going to the playoffs. Missed last season, but uh, went 7-4 and four in 2021, so they would have lost in the second round that year. They're the 2016 2A state champions. Uh, Cody Myers is their head coach. Lost four in a row midseason, but bounced back. Two good road wins to end the regular season. Um, lost to Hayworth, and then Hayworth lost to Stockton, so a little bit of familiarity there with yeah Stockton. that's what i wanted to point um, out that's i wanted to point yeah. that out real quick so yeah okay. so dear d mac loses to hayworth 41 14 but then you look at a team we're familiar with in stockton they beat hayworth 47 to 13 and stockton ended up four and five so right. i i don't know you know d mac you know d max Resume coming in, they're they're only five and four, but I yeah I, I'm not sure that uh, you know I I don't know I think this could be a game that Anwan Weathersfield controls. Yeah, um, I I did see a picture and I almost retweeted it. I, I think I just favorited it. They've got a couple sets of alternate uniforms, and it's they're crazy, okay, um, like crazy how. One's all camo, and it's and I've we've seen teams do camo before, and they're usually not very good. <laughs> this is a super this is a super good 
all camo uniform for DMEC. Okay. And then they've got this, I think it was black or gray version, and it's got like the like it's got like wings or, or chief feathers or whatever, like on the shoulder pads, and it's just got this funky design. Like, um, I'll have to just show it to you because I can't even explain it, but um I don't think they always wear them, but I just yeah. happened to see that they had a couple of those versions this year. So um, Tyce Albritton, he's a two-way player for for the Chiefs. Seems to be their go-to guy. Um, but I, I think you're right that I, I don't think they possess the tools to overcome a team like Anwan Weathersfield on the road. They've just been playing so good recently. Um, you know, they, they came up short in that, that week two game against Stark County by a point. They went for two, didn't get it. If they get that, we could be talking about the small school champion there in the LLC in Ann Arbor Weathersfield. But they had a great year, um, took care of business against Robo Williams Field. Zeb Rashid and Dylan Horry have, have really just been playing super well, as they did last year. Um, but this, this team's playing well. I, I think this is a team that I do think they're going to win this game. The winner of this plays the winner of Morrison Fulton. That will be a fun game as well. And so... Yeah, the way that they've been playing, I, I have no reason to think they're gonna they're gonna fall against Deer Creek Mackinac. Yeah, I mean, I, going back to the preseason, I think this is a Anawan Weathersfield Titans team that we've seen kind of been building up, you know, over the past couple of years. You know, they've they've been getting better incrementally, and outside of one stumbling block, they they've played some of the best football in our area. You know, in the last in the last few weeks, including a big win over Farmington, who's a playoff team. So you know, real in a, in a champion on the other side of the division. So really, that was a really good, you know, signature win for them in their season. And when you talk to head coaches around the LLC, the one name that comes up as far as like how to game plan against them, how do you stop him and the team, the name they're worried about, it's always Zeb Rashid. That yeah. that's a kid that, you know, he's a playmaker and he's hard to, he's hard to game plan against and he's hard to slow down and hard to stop. So in this matchup, yeah, I think if, if he can get going, I think this Anaheim Weathersfield team is moving into the second round. Yep, I agree. All right, let's get into Mitch. Oh, the big one in Ooh. Class 1A. Number 12 seed, Fulton. The Steamers go on the road just that short trip. What is it, Mitch? Like 17 minutes? Oh, not even. No, yeah. if, you're, <laughs> if you're walking, maybe. <laughs> okay. Fulton goes the short trip to Morrison High School, longtime rivals, meeting yep. up on the gridiron for the first time in a couple years. They just sat out last year. Yeah, 2021 was the last time they played. Yep. They battle for the wooden shoe. They've been doing that since 1977. The last meetup, Fulton won it 56 to nothing. But overall, Morrison leads the wooden shoe series 28 to 16. So it's a preview yep of an NUIC rivalry coming next year, but it's Fulton and Morrison meeting up on Saturday afternoon at one o'clock. I'm going to be there. I'm bringing my son with me. We're going to, oh, okay. we're going to go to this one. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited about this one. So got to figure out if I'm going to be there the whole time or if I make one more stop before that, but um, I'm excited, really, really uh, yeah. excited to get to that one. Okay. So quick, quick clarification that this, this game uh, we, we confirmed with with Jeff Parsons over there at Fulton that this will not be for the wooden shoe trophy. And there's there's a lot of discussion about that. A lot of Twitter back and forth. Is there or is there not previous games included already that were playoff matchups? I don't know. Um, the, the rules are the rules. If that's what they are, I think you should play it anytime the teams play. I, I understand why you might not do that, but I also just want to see this played <laughs> every time these two schools meet. So um yeah, you're gonna you're gonna be walking into a pretty good environment, I think. The the two really good communities, two really good football communities who care deeply about their their schools. You know, you you're gonna drive down Genesee Ave, and you're going to see signs on every telephone pole until you get to the school. Um, you're going to you're going to hear a lot of noise. You're going to see a lot of streamers. You're going to see a lot of a lot of everything, right? What everything that makes the playoffs great. Um, and it's it's just special that this matchup is being played 
not a lot. certainly it's 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 awesome that they're going to be in the same conference again. I almost think that this is a a cooler precursor to that than just meeting up in week nine, right? This is yep one the first game that they played since twenty twenty one where Fulton just absolutely beat the brakes off of Morrison. Um, but again, just kind of a precursor to what the year's coming, you know, what we can look forward to. So on the field, I look, I, I got some flack from some, some Morrisonites this week because I had said on the instant uh, reacts that I thought it was a tough draw for Morrison. And I do still believe that. What I did not do is I did not say Fulton was going to win. Let's get that straight. <laughs> Um, I did not predict that. I think Fulton is probably the hottest team coming in. Um, five and one, they, they, they did be, get beat up by Dupec pretty good there in that stretch, but it's hard to overlook what they did against Knoxville. Yep. That 42, nothing game in a, in a game that seemingly might've played into Knoxville's hands because they don't pass at all. Whereas Fulton does Don Kramer has over a thousand yards passing this year. Um, so it shows what Fulton is capable of doing. Does that mean they're going to beat Morrison? No, it doesn't. Um, could they? Sure. Of course they could because they've been playing so well, but that's what makes this, this matchup all that much more intriguing. These are two really, really good teams that have had really good seasons and it's, it's what the playoffs are all about and to have a rivalry game added into the mix just is going to make that environment a lot of fun for you, for you to be at, for everyone of both of those communities. It'll be packed to the brim. No question. Yeah. I think what I'm looking at in this matchup is the way Fulton's offensive line was really able to overpower Knoxville. It, a similar effort like that would, would Morrison be able to respond? Can, you know, and I, and I'm not, I'm not saying they can't, I'm not challenging you know, I'm just I'm I'm saying that I think that the way Fulton played in that one, the way they really came out and dominated the up front against Knoxville, if they do that again, I think that's a huge step for them. That's a huge, you know, advantage for them in this one. But you gotta contend with Morrison's speed. You have to you you have to be able to account for that. And that'll be a right. challenge on the Fulton side of things defensively. Yeah, and just you know, looking at the weather, right? It's not supposed to rain on Saturday, but it's supposed to. There's a chance of rain Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So that's going to be a saturated field, right? Could be similar to that Rock Ridge game where we did see. Now, again, we've been impressed with Rock Ridge all year. That defense is really, really good. But you also saw just Morrison's offense not really able to do much. Whether that was because it was a little sloppy, it's hard to say, right? But it, in any any situation, a, a wet field is going to slow down a fast team. So mm-hmm. that is maybe the Achilles heel here where Fulton's size could give them an edge. But again, Morrison does, does not quit. Even in that Rock Ridge game, they scored late. Rock Ridge had that miraculous drive to, to win that game. So uh, again, this, this will be fun. I'm really looking forward to this game. <sighs> if I had to pick, Oh. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Morrison, right? Um, one because you're a homer, Fulton, but two because um, <laughs> you're a homer, right? Uh, but two, I, I just if if Morrison doesn't clean up the penalties that they've had the past couple of weeks, because that really has been an issue for them. It happened in the Rock Ridge game. They got off to a slow start against BV. You can't do that. You cannot do that against Fulton. They will take advantage of that. And they will they will score. They will hold the ball. Dom Kramer, um, you know that whole team. Boardman, Boardman and Crooks. Yep. Yep. They they will jump on that opportunity if you leave those doors open. So um, if that doesn't happen, if Morrison plays the way they played against against Princeton against whomever, I think they'll win. If if they do have hiccups like they've shown the past couple of weeks, that's going to open the door for a Fulton win. Man, we've talked about it with, you know, different teams over the years. Sometimes I think a loss at some point in a season, especially after you had such a huge win against a team like Princeton, I think maybe sometimes a loss is the best kind of gut check or like that 
kind of snap back to reality, right? You know, you know that any any team can get you on any night. I think mentally, it, maybe it sounds weird to say it, but that can be a positive, right? To know in the back of your mind, like we can't afford this letdown. A team can come up and bite us. So I yep. think that maybe mentally, there, you know, for, Morrison's going into this game, you know, dialed in because they they know, you know, they've seen it. So, I, however it shakes out, man, it's gonna be a great matchup. I'm excited for this one. I, I think the only thing, right, when I'm just if 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 the conditions do play into this game, right, we know that that Morrison doesn't throw that much anyway, so you might not see it from from Colton Bielema. We know that Fulton does though, and so if if the rain is going to slow down the passing attack, I think Morrison may be more equipped to handle that, right? Um, and they can spread the ball to their numerous different weapons. So we'll see. Again, I, I anytime Fulton Morrison play is exciting to have it in a playoff game. I I can't remember the last time that they that this happened. Um but yeah, I'm I'm absolutely looking forward to this game and uh, I think we talked about it in the last preview. The winner of this game would go on to play the winner of Anawan Weathersfield and Deer Creek Mackinac. Yeah. The winner of that the winner of that game would eventually go and face potentially Lena Winslow in the quarterfinals. All right, Mitch, the last question about Fulton and Morrison. I gotta, I gotta put you, I gotta ask you, I gotta get your opinion here. Yeah. When, when I'm shooting highlights at Morrison, inevitably most 90% of the time I'm shooting on the home side, even though, even though there's no backdrop on the other side, for those who don't know, Morrison has all their bleachers on the home side for home man visitors. It's a big grandstand. And then the other side is just a press box and it's, right. it's empty, just trees behind you. I have in a couple playoff games shot on the visitors sideline. Yeah, I, I think, I think you're on to something there because I remember seeing, I think it was a DP video for, um, for FCA. Yeah. One of the, one of the state championship years. Yep. He had shot from the visitor side and, and yeah, you see, you see the team spirit, you see the colors, you see the fans. So yeah, I don't disagree with with that. Um, I feel like I miss out on some of the I miss out on some of the atmosphere because I'm 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 disconnected, right. you know. And it's not and it's not an atmosphere that you would see on a typical Friday night, right? Like it's it jumps up a notch for playoffs. Yeah. Um. And so yeah, I think that's always a good idea to get as much of the crowd as you can. And so you'd have to walk the Fulton sidelines and yeah. avoid avoid the press box. But I think that would be ultimately the best call. I just think it makes it look so much bigger on a, you know, yeah. on a playoff game. So I, I might have to do right. it. If you, if I have, if I have the Mitch Stormer stamp of approval, maybe I will, maybe I'll yeah. head over to the Fulton sideline and that's no disrespect to Morrison. I just, I want to see the fans in the background of the shot. I just think it, it adds to everything, makes it look bigger. So hang over there with coach Laura and the steamers. That's right. That's right. All right. A couple more games here to get into in class one, a Princeville, the 15 seed. They finish at five and four. They go on the road, a rematch, a conference rematch at number two, Stark County, who finished the season nine and oh, Friday night, 7 p.m., Gary Johnson Field. Mitch, I got to say, Gary Johnson Field on a Friday night playoff game is, is the best. It is such a great atmosphere. Now, I say that, and uh, I, I'm, I'm going to let down Coach Nord when I, when I say this on the podcast. I don't think I can make it out there Friday night. I was mm. really hoping, was really hoping I could do it, but I'm going to go Saturday to the game we just talked about on Friday night. Yep. My kids have a Halloween thing at the school. And so, you know, I miss a lot of Friday nights throughout the, you know, football season. I think on this Friday, if we have a, you know, school function and the kids are going to, I should probably be there. So I, I am obligated. I cannot make it. And I feel bad about that. But uh, to anyone who's listening, who's questioning, maybe going to that game, go for it. It's it. You won't regret it. It's a great atmosphere there. So Stark County, you know, Mitch, they're riding all kinds of momentum here. Nine and oh, you know, they're, they're, you know, rolling along here. Luke Rewerts and, you know, and that, and that group really playing some good football right now, but you got to, you got to get a rematch here. You got to get a win over a team you've already beaten once this year. And that, that doesn't always come automatically. It doesn't always come easy. 
right? I, in this one, I think it will. <laughs> um, you know, just, just, okay, the way the dude, well. just the way the Star County has been playing, you know, uh, Luke Rewerts, Matthew Bowser, uh, Nolan Orwig, just on, on both sides of the ball, the Rebels have been so, so good. A tight game against United um, in week nine, you know, who knows if, if emotions of, of senior night or the pressure of being undefeated, you know, might've gotten to them a little bit, but that was really their only, only real struggle this year, other than that week two game um, against Anawan Weathersfield. And that's understandable. So, you know, looking forward, looking forward to this, the Stark County team who I think can make a run here. I think they got a good draw in that kind of bottom part of the bracket. Um, and yeah, I, I think they will get their second win over principal here uh, this year and move on. Yeah. All right. Yep. That sounds good. Um, and they, they would go where they would play the winner of the next game we're going to talk about. Yep. I was going to say they'll play the winner of Rova Williams field. Who's the 10 seed seven and two. They go on the road to Sterling Newman, central Catholic also seven and two Saturday, one o'clock at Sterling. I have not mm. checked in. I have not checked in with WQAD yet. If they want me to start, in Sterling for the first half for the first quarter in a little bit and then go to Morrison or if I'm locked down at Morrison, I, I have not heard yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's doable. I mean, it, it's, there's it's, a lot of Friday nights that I've done that. So yeah, it's, it's too bad that that's not like a one and then a four, you know, yeah, like a I, one and a seven that that stinks. I know. I really, I, I, uh, I made some, I, I texted, you know, some people, and I was wishing that it could have been a staggered start time, but it was already yep. on. It was already on IHSA dot, you know, IHSA football before I could uh, even reach out to know what what I could have gotten, you know. But either way, either way, it'll it'll work out just fine. So Newman has only missed the playoffs four times since 1985. So yep. <laughs> very strong program. Obviously, most people listening already know that. And speaking yeah, of, made, you know, they've made it. Made it every year consecutively since 20 or sorry, 2001. So what, 22, yeah. 23 consecutive? Yeah. Yep. Great program led by head coach Mike LeMay. Great defense. This, this Newman Central Catholic team this year in particular has been led by their defense. They've, they've continued to produce week in and week out. And that's a strong asset to have heading into the playoffs. Yeah. Only 119 points allowed. Um, which ranked third in the Mississippi, but you're talking about two really good defenses in Princeton and Kiwani. But yeah, th this you go back to that week one win over Rock Ridge, and at the time we thought, boy, that's an upset. And as the season went on, um, it proved to not be a fluke or anything like that. This is a really, really good Newman team. Um, only other blemish was that that game against Kiwani where they had some miscues early and Kiwani scored on both of them and it was raining and you know, this, that, and the other thing. Um, but then to, to close out the year, a 50, nothing win over Mendota. This is a good team. This is a good team with a great defense. You know, we, we've, we've said it all year, you know, 50 was the most that they scored all year prior to that. It was 28. So we we've always wanted to see a little bit more consistency from their offense, but the defense is going to keep them in games it has all year. It's going to have to because the Rova Williams field offense is really, really good. We've, we've always talked it up. We've always been excited to see those numbers come out every single week from them. I, I tweeted out when, when the bracket came out that I was probably the most excited about this game because I think you have a, a really good, a really good offense with the Cougars and a, an elite defense with the Comets coming together in a playoff game. And that's ultimately what you're always looking for. Yeah. This, this matchup is intriguing. I, I would say it's probably the most intriguing from a, you know, play style, you know, two, two styles matching up here with the defense for Sterling Newman and the offense for Ro Rova Williams field. You're talking about Riley Danner at quarterback for the Cougars um, over 1500 yards, passing 15 touchdowns, Brian Bertel chauffeur, over a thousand yards rushing, 14 touchdowns. And they have several athletes that can make plays. They they can spread it out a little bit. Danner can throw the ball. He can run the ball a little bit. He does a great job of running that offense. And so I think that, you know, 
this is a program in Rova Williams Field and the Cougars that they've been building up and they've had this, you know, kind of core group together for the last couple of seasons. They have mm-hmm. a lot of experience. They got a playoff win a year ago. I think that this could be the year that, you know, potentially to make a little bit of a run here. But it's a tough, you know, you got to score some points on a tough Newman defense before you start. Yep. Um, and, for, and for Newman, right, that they seem to have found found a gem with Evan Bushman at quarterback. I think he had three touchdown passes uh, on Friday. Dan Kelly, Carter Rude running the ball. So, you know, they've shown signs of, of a good offense. They, you know, I, I don't want to make it seem like they – are just an anemic offense. We just want to see more consistency with it. But again, when you have that defense, they're going to have the ball. They're going to have the opportunity to do so. Putting up 15 week eight, maybe a good start. Maybe they, they really can, can continue to build off of that. But again, I, I don't even want to predict this game. It's a toss up to me. So, yep. you know, Sterling at home with that defense, maybe I'm leaning that way. I don't want to upset the Roman Williams field people any more than I already do. <laughs> um, but again, I just have been so impressed with, with their defense. And in the end, that's what wins you games. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Dan, Daniel Kelly. He's been the, you know, the, the driving force on the defensive side of the ball as well. He, he's the name to watch for mm-hmm. on that defense among, among many good athletes on that defensive side of the ball for Newman. But um, yeah, just that, you know, that Rova Williams field offense against the Newman defense. That's the, that's the matchup there. And, it, and it's a good one. And uh, like you said, the winner of that would play Stark County or Princeville. So another interesting matchup. And I do think for all the teams we just listed, I do think there's a pretty good path down the way to get to a, you know, a quarterfinal berth or maybe even a semifinal berth, just based on what the bottom half of that bracket looks like. So it's, yeah. it's exciting. I think there's, yeah, there's a chance for a team to make a run here if you, you know, if you play well. So Mitch, yeah, have we wrapped? I, What's I, that? I do think if I had to just look that far ahead, I think you're going to see Lena playing against. Ooh, look at you making I'll predictions say Star, I'll, say Star, I'll say Stark County. I think All that's right. where this could lead to. And that, that would be a fun matchup with a trip to, uh, to normal. Uh, on the line. All right, look, man, Mitch, you're throwing out predictions this this week. So, yep. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna not I'm gonna not say anything else because I'll be covering the, some of these games. I'll be walking the sideline. I don't need to be. You know, <laughs> they can all give yeah, you the goal. You don't want that smoke. Yeah. <laughs> Have we talked enough? Eleven man. Are we going eight man here to wrap up the podcast? Whew. Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's jump into the eight man playoffs. We got a few matchups to talk about. If you want to hear all the brackets, Mitch, we read through them on our Instant Reacts Bracket Podcast. Again, available on Twitter, Twitter Spaces. We were we were live after the brackets came out, so we kind of talked through all the matchups. We'll talk about the matchups involving our local teams here. The eight nine matchup: Ridgewood seven and two goes on the road to South Fork, also seven and two. So we know about South Fork running backs George Bailey and Brody Lush lead the way. For them on the opposite side, Ridgewood, uh, they have Roy Sanders, who's been a constant running back for them. You also have Riley Couture, this Ridgewood team, seven and two, but a battle tested seven and two. They yeah. just lost to Polo and they gave Amboy. I think the closest game Amboy's had all year. So there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of talk around this Ridgewood Spartans team. Well, you said they just lost to Polo. Uh, and Amboy, that was in the middle of the year. They've won four straight heading into this game. So, yeah, we really like what Ridgewood is doing. The Spartans and, and Coach Elder really have things really have things going pretty good. So, um, these two teams did not play in the regular season. So, a, a rare first time matchup in the playoffs for for eight man teams. So, yeah, looking forward to seeing this one. Um, is it? Do we know what day it is? Probably Saturday. I am not sure. I did not get some okay. of the dates here on uh, on some of these. So. Moving down the way, the 12 seed River Ridge, they get in at five and four. They go on the road to number five seeded Martinsville, who's seven and two. So what stands out to me right away about Martinsville is in their week nine matchup, which was, um, I think that was Saturday afternoon. 
they played St. Thomas More and they only lost 20 to 14. So a St. Thomas More team with Peace Bumba, who we've been really impressed with, you know, at the you know statewide level of eight man. They're entering the playoffs at nine and zero, oh, but Martinsville gave them a great game there. So this mm-hmm. Martinsville team, you know, they lost to Amboy sixty to eight. So they, you know, they got handled by Amboy. But a lot of teams, you know, had that same problem with Amboy. He's a very good program. We'll talk about them in a minute. But otherwise, they've really gotten the job done here. On the flip side, River Ridge, Seth Nicholas and Damon Dittmer combined for about a thousand yards. Dittmer on, on the ground, I should say, and Dittmer also passed for 855 yards and eight touchdowns. So this River Ridge team has, you know, has some uh, explosive playmakers. Is it enough to get past Martinsville? That's a, you know, tough test on the road in round one. Yeah, another matchup that we did not see in the regular season. So, yeah, you, you mentioned it, that Martinsville played St. Thomas more really tough. So um, I, I like the way that they've played all year. I expect them to come away with this round one win over River Ridge. Yep. Quickly moving down the list, Hiawatha, the 15 seed. They get in at a four and five record. They go on the road to the Harbor against the Amboy, Lamoille, Ohio Clippers, the number two seed at nine and oh. Mitch, what else do we say about this Amboy team that, you know, we haven't said throughout the year. They're a, a great team and they are one of the favorites to be headed to Monmouth to play for a state championship. Yeah, I think they'll be taking that first step here this weekend. Did not play Hiawatha during the regular season, but uh, Hiawatha loses that week nine game and then still gets in. So, yeah, tough draw for them to play Lamoille, who is is the proverbial favorite here in eight man. So I do expect, again, the Clippers to take that first step here towards a state championship. Yep. So Orangeville, the 14th seed, they're five and four. They go on the road to Milledgeville, the three seed. So an NUIC rivalry here. In the first round of the eight-man playoffs, Orangeville on the road at Milledgeville. The missiles are eight and one. I believe I was at this game. It was, yes, yeah. it was week four. I was I was covering this one in Milledgeville. Um, the first time around, Milledgeville got the win 50 to 24. Connor Nye looked good in that one. Micah Tom Smith had a touchdown. Um, Connor Nye's brother also had an interception when I was there. I believe it's Spencer Nye, if I'm remembering yes. correctly. Okay, yes. Yep. So Spencer, I didn't want to call him just, you know, Connor's little brother. That's not fair. So right. <laughs> so anyway, Spencer Nye had an, had an interception when I was there. He lo- looked good. So Milledgeville sitting at 8-1, and one, their only loss coming to Amboy. They've played really well this season. They have a lot of weapons. Mitch, I know Amboy's the favorite, but I think this Milledgeville team's got a shot. They, they, they have a shot at pulling a potential upset if it ends up being them going up against Amboy before they get to the state championship game. Well, that's, that's who you picked, right? That's, I, that was your, uh, I did. I, because the other two had taken the same, they had taken Amboy and taken Ridgewood. So I thought I kind of want to buck the trend and go somewhere different. So I, I did, I went out on a limb and I, I took Milledgeville to go all the way to Monmouth and actually win the state championship. So, you know, I'll jump on that bandwagon there, I guess. Yep. All right, one more game to cover here for our local area teams in uh, eight-man, 11-seeded West Prairie, 6-3. and three. Goes on the road to Polo and the Marcos. They're the sixth seed at 7-2. and two. West Prairie has Xavier Hilton, who leads the way for them. On the opposite side, the Polo Marcos have played really well this season outside of the stumble to Milledgeville, and then they just lost in Week 9. Lost pretty big to Amboy. Yeah. And I, I thought that one would be a little bit closer. Ends up being 52 to six. So Amboy really flexed his muscles in the end here. Polo is still a great team. Brock Solto, Carter Murdian, Noah Dewey, Dilo Fernandez, the names we've talked about a lot this year. They're versatile, right? I mean, you got Solto yeah. throwing passes, catching passes, rushing it in. So they, they, they're dynamic on offense. They can do a lot of things to kind of confuse you. I think I like Polo in this first round matchup. Yeah, the Polo is, uh, they've won two eight-man championships, right? Yes. They've won half yep. of them. Yeah, so, mm-hmm. yep, a good a good program. They, they had another great year. I, I also think I'll take them here in, in the West Perry game, and they'll move on. Yeah, for eight-man discussion, if you like the eight-man d- division, uh, I encourage you to go out to Facebook, and it's uh, 
Spotlight on I8FA. It's a statewide podcast. Uh, Joe Meridian, who was joined us on the NUIC football playoff preview. Great guy, really knows his stuff. He, uh, he, he helped me out. He, he had a lot of great info about the eight-man division, but um, we'll be following along here, Mitch, because as we've seen in the past couple of years, the eight-man tournament, you know, the eight-man playoffs get really exciting really quickly because you have some right. big-time matchups. And, uh, and it, let's be honest, our, our teams from our area have had success. So, yep. you know, as they have success, it's fun for us to watch and follow along. So, And, and you, get a, you get a state championship a week before uh, the 11-man. So they get, they get done a week earlier. And, yep. um, again, this, this whole tournament and that state final are, are, always, are always good viewing. So looking forward to uh, the eight-man playoffs just as much as the 11-man. Is this the year that I go to Monmouth that I finally see the eight-man state championship game? <sighs> I mean, you need to you need to go. It's just yeah. so windy there. It's always so windy. And it's cold. It's oh, just, come on! We, you can handle it. I I'm I do it. Going, so yeah, I'll handle it from the comfort of my couch. No question about that. <laughs> I want to get there. It sounds like a great atmosphere. It sounds like a ton of fun. So I want to get there. But also, I know that uh, you know I may may want to be at Hancock Stadium on the on the Friday of you know, state championship 11. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta, too. You gotta save your weekends. We've been talking about this. You got to save your weekends. That's right. That's right. So last question, Mitch, do I start in Sterling? Do I offer WQAD that I start in Sterling and then go to Morrison or do I just campaign to be at Morrison the whole time? <laughs> They're both going to be, I, I expect them both to be really good games. I know. I don't know what to do. I got to think about it. If if I had to to guess, just just because they're so close, you know Fulton's going to travel, right? Not nothing against Robo Williamsfield because it's not that far to get to Sterling, but I'm just saying you're you're ten minutes down the road from Fulton, um, or, or to Morrison from Fulton. So I think that that Ian Bud Cole Field is going to be rocking. I think it's going to be packed. Um, and, and yeah, just a, a rivalry game in the playoffs. Yep, is, is where I where where I would go. But again, I think that Robert Williamsfield and Newman is going to be a really really good game, no yeah. doubt. I think I could get to both, but I just I hate to miss, you know, right. miss, miss out on the beginning of one. So any, anyway, anyway, or the end of the other, you know, whatever. So right. All right. Well, that'll wrap it up, Mitch. This is uh, you know, probably going to be the biggest, longest episode of the year. Um, yep. Because, you know, inevitably teams are going to start falling by the wayside, but we got through it. My voice held out. If, if, I, if there's any, any consolation to our loyal listeners is that every episode from here on out gets much shorter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my vocal cords will thank that because Mitch, yeah. it's it, it's been a struggle here the last few minutes. I, I'm making it. I'm making it across the finish line here. Yeah. So what did what did what did we say? Maybe Four Friday night games, something like that. Four or five. Yeah, it sounds about right. Kiwani, so. um, Stark County, a um, couple of the Monmouth Rosevilles, I, I believe, on a Friday. Yes. So, oh. yeah. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll get the, the action started on, on Friday. I, I have no idea if we'll do an instant reaction or not that night. And then Saturday afternoon, get the rest of those games out of the way. And then we'll uh, we'll have our normal programming this time next week looking looking back at, at round one and, and see who we've got left standing going on to round two. Yeah. I'd say, um, yeah, there's a, a strong possibility. We'll get an instant reacts pot out there. So we'll see, see how the night shapes up and, uh, right. you know, we're never short. We're never short on, uh, talking. So we might as well get out right. and talk more. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you everyone who listens, who follows along. We appreciate it. Um, we can't wait to keep talking about the playoffs here. Let's keep moving down the way. I can't wait to be walking the sidelines on a Saturday afternoon. It's going to be, it's going to be great. Mitch, I'll I'll take pictures for you. I'll send some videos your way. Oh, I'll be, I'll be watching. Don't you worry. All right. That sounds good. Well, thank you to everyone. And Mitch, thank you. We will see you next week. That'll do it for this week's episode of View from the West. Thank you so much for listening. I encourage you to go out to Apple Podcasts or Podbean and subscribe so you can follow along and downloads will come automatically every week. You can follow along on Twitter at ViewFromWestPod. You can also email me if you're interested in being a sponsor, ViewFromWestPod at gmail.com. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week.